This is the Flint City Council meeting brought to you by the Flint City Council and presented by Spectacle Productions. Don't just watch TV, make it. And underwritten in part by the Flint Pipe Fitters Union. Looking for pipe fitters apprentices throughout Flint. Madam Clerk, would you please do roll call? Mr. Mays? Present. Mr. Davis? Present. Ms. Fields? Present. Mr. Winfrey? Present. This is the February 28th, 2018 City of Mr. Special City Council meeting. Present. Ms. Worthing? Present. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. As we all may know, as of December 15th, 2017, state legislation went into effect that allowed communities, if they so chose, to draft an opt-in ordinance for medical marijuana facilities. 
For some time now, our city's planning and development department, along with our legal department, have been working diligently to draft an opt-in ordinance for our city. Therefore, the purpose of the meeting this afternoon is for us to receive a comprehensive overview of the proposed ordinance. Draft copies of that ordinance are in the back table. Here to present the overview are Attorney Reed Erickson from our legal department and Kevin Schrantz from the planning and development department. Gentlemen, would you please uh, come forward now? And questions and answers by council will happen after their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, I'm Reed Erickson, Assistant City Attorney. And uh, of course, we have Kevin Schrantz here, um, Planner 3 from the Planning and Zoning Department. Uh, Kevin's going to start off, and we're going to kind of alternate as we go through the PowerPoint presentation. So I'll direct your attention there, although, of course, we'll verbalize everything. And you should all have paper copies of, this, uh, of these slides as well. And uh, without further delay, we'll, we'll get started. Thank you, Reed, and thank you, Council. Again, Kevin Trons of Planning and Development. Um, as Reed mentioned, we made handouts for you guys, so hopefully follow along. Um, but what we're going to do here is spend some time. Spend some time. Can everyone hear me? Okay. We're going to spend some time um, covering the presentation, just as Reed mentioned, and we're going to kind of piggyback on each other and then um, open it up into to discussion amongst you all and, and, and Reed and I and staff. Um, so the presentation and the scope of the presentation is kind of broke down into really four parts. We're going to give a brief history on medical marijuana in the state of Michigan and then give an overview of the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, which as uh, Council, Councilwoman Worthing pointed out, uh, as of December 15th, some major changes went into effect and this is kind of the response, you know, kind of give you guys a, an overview of, of those and what that act is. Uh, the third part, we will get into the overview of the city's draft ordinance, which is before you, uh, which has been worked on for, as you'll see, kind of uh, in this timeline, um, over a year now um, of, of work. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we'll kind of get into some discussion and, and with you all. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it back to Reed to cover some of the, um, of the history of the medical marijuana and the, the kind of Lara body. Thank you, Kevin. So as Kevin touched on, uh, medical marijuana has uh, been the law of the land, so to speak, in the state of Michigan since November of 2008, went through a voter uh, ballot initiative. Uh, the Michigan voters uh, approved the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Now, what is noteworthy in that Medical Marijuana Act is it references caregivers and patients. It does not reference dispensaries or provisioning centers, uh, and I use those terms interchangeably. Um, or the commercial sale of marijuana to qualified patients or caregivers. It neither prohibits nor uh, allows them. It makes no reference to those practices whatsoever. Uh, in February of 2013, the Michigan Supreme Court, in the case of People versus McQueen, uh, arguably made the commercial sale of, sale of marijuana at best a legal gray area because it specifically prohibited the use of a co-op operation uh, I would not say that that's directly analogous to the provisioning centers that the city has allowed, but it's certainly fair to say that it created a level of uncertainty surrounding commercial uh, medical marijuana dispensary operations, depending on your jurisdiction. In February of 2014, uh, the Michigan Supreme Court in Turbeek versus Wyoming, the, the village of Wyoming, uh, kind of went in the other direction and struck down a local ordinance which, through its zoning, prohibited uh, any use contrary to federal or state law, and they, uh, the Supreme Court there held that, in fact, the rights created under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act preempted uh, the local ordinance, so therefore uh, the rights created under that law superseded the zoning ordinance, which wholly prohibited it. In September of 2016, uh, the state legislature adopted three bills that we're going to now attempt to address in our medical marijuana opt-in ordinance for which we are all meeting to discuss today. Uh, specifically, those bills have addressed that, uh, that elephant in the room, if you will, of commercialization of medical marijuana, as well as uh, medibles, or otherwise mar marijuana edibles, uh, which was passed by both, ho both houses and signed into law by the governor. And those laws are Public Act 281, the Mar Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, Public Act 282, the Marijuana Trafficking Act, which 
much like the state of Colorado is doing for their uh, actually full-scale recreational marijuana market, is doing a, a um, seed-to-sale tracking system so that all marijuana can be accounted for and through that system uh, kept away from the black market. And then Public Act 283, which amended the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act to provide for those uh, medibles, the, uh, the edible products, and prohi uh, prohibits resident e extraction uh, in residential areas uh, because individuals were using, I believe, butane, which is a very unsafe means of potentially creating uh, medical marijuana resin or, or oil, um, and obviously that's a, a highly combustible chemical. Uh, so these acts took effect on December 20th, 2016, uh, and the state legislature gave one year to essentially get ready so that uh, these, uh, specifically the Medical Marijuana um, Licensing Act, went into effect on December 15th of 2017. And uh, as this body is aware, we've had a number of discussions about that uh, state law and the effect on our local ordinance and the opt-in process, uh, which is why we are all here today. So specifically, Public Act 281, the MMF, MMFLA, for short, creates five types of medical marijuana facilities, or five distinct licenses that the city can choose to uh, grant all, none, or some combination of. And so those five licenses are a grower, which would, you would think of like a greenhouse or a, or a warehouse industrial style operation using grow lights to, uh, and there are a number of subclasses of that growing license, you have class A, which would be 500 plants, a class B license would allow 1,000 plants, and a class C license would allow up to 1,500 plants to that license holder. A processor, uh, by contrast, actually uh, extracts the resin from those marijuana plants and to create marijuana-infused products. So a processor may simply create oils that can be then used for cooking or what have you with your medical marijuana patients or it can make the actual products such as um, topical oils or, or what have you for any patients to receive their medicine in, in the preferred form. Um, the next license is a secure transporter and I, I think of it like a Brinks truck. Um, it transports the marijuana and cash between facilities because uh, these organizations are largely cash operations and they can also store marijuana for short periods of time and ultimately act as a courier, if you will, between uh, a grower and a processor or, or a grower and a uh, provisioning center uh, or uh, the retail operation, if you will. Uh, safety compliance facility, the fourth kind of license, uh, tests samples of the marijuana for contaminants as, as well as it, its active, active ingredients. And uh, to use alcohol a, as the comparison, uh, obviously there's a big difference between a, a bottle of beer and a bottle of bourbon for the amount of alcohol that you're consuming. And one of the things that other states have run into when it comes to labeling is these products may have a certain amount of THC, which is the active ingredient of marijuana. Uh, it may have a little or it may have a lot. And so uh, these safety compliance facilities would be able to test for the, the potency of the products being received as well as for contaminants, mold or pesticides or, and that sort of thing. Uh, last is the provisioning center, which this body is probably most aware of because we have a, a current ordinance, I'll call it the old ordinance, allowing for provisioning centers already. And those are the dispensaries, as they're commonly referred, but provisioning center is the technical term where these marijuana patients can um, purchase their, their medicine uh, from caregivers or, in the case of the Facilities Act, uh, licensees who have a provisioning center license. <clears throat> so the state licensing process um, First, the applicant for the state license must not have a controlled substance felony within the last 10 years. They must not have a controlled substance misdemeanor uh, conviction within the past five years. Uh, they cannot be an elected official or governmental employee. And they, until June 30th of, of 2018, they must be a Michigan resident. Now, the nature of the license is that it's a revocable privilege, not a property right. And in fact, they, uh, licensees will have to uh, reapply for renewal every year with the state of Michigan as well as with the city under our draft ordinance that you have before you. It's a sub subject to examination at any time by law enforcement. That's a condition specifically of receiving the license. Um, and they must do background checks on any potential employee. Um, as far as revenue, there's a non-refundable state application fee uh, as well as a state regulatory assessment and a 3% tax on retail sales at the provisioning centers 
which will then a portion of which be distributed later to the opt-in municipalities uh, that, that participate uh, in the Facilities Licensing Act. So the capitalization requirements, um, and I want to be clear that uh, in December of uh, last year, Lara put out emergency rules uh, that were promulgated under an emergency basis because through the ordinary administrative process, they wouldn't be ready in time for the December 15th deadline. I believe the rules were released on December the 4th of 2017. So I, I say that caveat because I do anticipate permanent rules in the coming months. I, I have no basis to think that those rules would substantially differ from the emergency rules, but these emergency rules are technically only valid for the next six months um, unless they're extended uh, by Lara. Uh, so, but one of those rules establishes capitalization requirements and that's subject to Lara. It's, it's not something that the city is requiring, but it is requiring for these various licenses that the, the applicant have a certain amount of capital depending on the license in question. So a grower for a class A license must have $150,000 in capital, class B 300 and uh, class C $500,000. A processor has to have $300,000 in capital, provisioning center also $300,000, a secure transport $200,000, and safety compliance facility $200,000, and at least 25% of that capital must be in liquid assets convertible to cash, and again, that's pursuant to the law rules. That's nothing that we're proposing or really have any say in one way or the other at the city level. Those rules are also permitting a stacked license, so a class C grower may apply to stack multiple licenses and, and hold multiple licenses at one facility, uh, they would have to pay separate application fees to apply for that license and renew those licenses at the city and the state levels, but theoretically uh, a licensee could be granted three Class C licenses at 1,500 plants and be permitted to have 4,500 plants at that one facility, subject of course to state and city approval. And the uh, growing facilities are permitted only in industrial or agriculturally zoned areas. Uh, the state did give the city a lot of room to determine what would be best for this opt-in ordinance when it comes to meeting the needs of the city. But one of the things that is uh, black and white is that we're, we're not permitted to issue growing licenses anywhere that but industrial or agricultural zones. And the city does not have any agricultural zones, so it would be strictly industrial. Um, next slide. So operation at the same location or, or co-location. Uh, so the state is allowing uh, the operation, the combination of growing licenses, processing or provisioning uh, center licensees to operate at the same location subject to a couple conditions. Uh, first, it has to be authorized by LARA, which the emergency rules have said is the case. Uh, it also needs to be authorized by the local ordinance. And as long as our conditions are met, uh, the uh, licensee must then pay the fee for each license, have distinct and identifiable areas with designated structures that are continuous and specific to the license, and uh, have separate entrances and exits, inventory, record keeping, and point of sale operations. So they can be on one site, but they need to be uh, distinct from each other. And at that point, I'm actually going to uh, let Kevin take over for a couple of slides uh, to discuss kind of the city's response and the timeline of, of where we've been on this. Thank you, Reed. So uh, just a brief timeline uh, to for a little clarity, because I know a handful of uh, council members actually were not uh, on board when the process actually started back in April 2015, but it's um, in April 2015, an emergency order was signed by the emergency manager at the time that actually um, allowed the commercial sale, sale of medical marijuana. So that is, as Reed mentioned, the old provisioning center ordinance, which is actually still in place today, but that order was signed in April 2015 by the um, emergency manager, and I, I will say, obviously, there was some staff involvement in the creation of that uh, ordinance. December of 16, as Reed mentioned, um, you know, is when we, uh, from the state, we knew things were going to change, and staff really began in earnest uh, trying to come into compliance on a new ordinance that addressed kind of what we saw was happening at the state level. May of 2017, uh, Reed and myself went before the um, the council at that time, I requested a 180 day moratorium on, as Reed mentioned, the old provisioning center ordinance to allow us to understand what the state was going to do. There were a lot of unknowns and whatnot, so we thought it was best to just put the moratorium in place and see where the state was going and then draft a new ordinance that came into compliance. Um, 
that motion was denied by council and the recommendation from council to staff was to move forward on the draft ordinance and that's really what we've been working on continue to work on then from march 2017 to the 2018 of february this month um, so revisions continued on that draft on october uh, 24th of 2018 or 2017 it should say um, the planning commission flint planning commission held a public hearing on the draft and then on last night at their meeting, the 28th of February, the Flint Planning Commission approved the draft that's in front of you for recommendation to you all. So per city charter, they uh, recommend ordinance changes to this body and then ultimately this body, um, you know, formally has the position to, as you guys know, um, adopt and then it goes into effect. So breaking down now and, and this uh, breaking down what is in the draft starting at the number so as reed mentioned um laura provided quite a bit of leeway to the local municipalities if the if they so choose even to opt in then when they opt in both the numbers and zoning regulations and so on and so forth so really gave power at the local level um, on zoning issues to handle these uses so what the current draft states as you guys will see in, in your 20 page document um, for any growing license class a b or c so 500 1,000 or 1,500, there would be no limit to the amount of licenses that the city of Flint um, would give out. And I think it's important to preface this if they go through the process and they get the approval that and all that is in here. So there would be no cap on that number of growing licenses. The same goes for the number of processing licenses. There'd be no limit on those. Uh, we would limit at five each the secure transport. So as Reed may mention, kind of the movement of the product from one facility to the other and the movement of the cash from one facility to the other. Five, a limit of five on those. A limit of five on the safety compliance. There's um, quite a bit of detail from the state, sim similar to pharmaceuticals, on how much content, you know, what is the potency of the medicine, and that is all regulated at the state level at these facilities. So a limit of five licenses on those types of uh, facilities. And then the provisioning center. Uh, so as Reed mentioned, the actual kind of retail element, the only retail element of these five uses, we would limit on 20. And we will get into, uh, at, towards the end of the presentation, Reed will touch on this, but that 20 would be minus the current number that are legally operating in the city. So we would subtract the current number. We're proposing we would subtract the current number um, so the difference between the two, up to 220 would be still allowed. And for what that's worth, there are currently 13 that operate within the city of Flint. So focusing just on provisioning centers, and that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go through the provisioning centers, and then we treat growing and processing very similar, and then the safety compliance and the secure transport and kind of the zoning regulations on each one. And then we're going to, um, I'm gonna pass it back to Reed to kind of close this out. So looking at the proposed zoning regulations of the medical marijuana provisioning center. So again, the, think of this as the retail element where individuals, if you are a cardholder, come in to purchase your medicine or your product. Uh, so there would, they would be permitted in the D5, D6, E, F, and G zoning districts. So very high level, E, F, and G are, are industrial zoning districts. And D5 and D6 are basically highway commercial. So think of your Dort Highways or Clio Roads. They're heavily trafficked. Um, they have a lot of traditional retail and whatnot. Those are the D5 and D6 districts. Um, there would be a thousand foot buffer between schools. And again, this includes uh, not only Flint community schools, but it does include charter schools or let's say, you know, parochial schools. And it also includes the early childhood education facilities. So the ed example, the EduCare facility, and we're, we're seeing more of those pop up. So that includes those. They, they're state licensed early childhood education facilities. A thousand feet from public parks. Um, these are pieces of land that are deeded to the city, were deeded to the city at the turn of the century and have deed restrictions on land for public park purposes. Um, the residential, uh, and then a thousand feet from a place of worship um, which is a, a list we keep close with the clerk's office on, you know, these are active, um, you know, residential places or places of worship. And then lastly, um, or not lastly, but the 300 foot residential zoning district requirement. So that would be a 300 basically feet setback if it's um, zoned in A, B, or C. Those are the city's residential districts. 
So it has to be 300 feet, and that is common in any mailings we do. We're required by state law to do 300 feet, so that's how that amount came up. Um, also, we've, over the last few years, gotten, you know, we've kind of built that out through feedback we've received. And then lastly, and this is a current, kind of in the current provisioning center ordinance, no more than four, four provisioning centers or adult entertainment within 2,000 feet. So if you were if you were to draw a at a facility and draw basically a, a, a circle around 2,000 feet out, you couldn't have four more existing within that circle, and that's really to limit the amount of nuisance uses within one area. Uh, some additional uh, reg zoning regulation, and the, this is just kind of I think the more maybe the higher level pertinent stuff, and there's a lot more as you'll see in the draft code. Um, the operating hours are limited between 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday, 12 to noon, 12 noon to 6 p.m. on Sundays. Um, the co-location of a provisioning center uh, with a grow or a processing facility is permitted. Um, however, if you co-locate, which means more than one use, one of those uses at one facility, the structure must be 30,000 square feet minimum. So the building footprint must be 30,000 square feet for minimum. Um, Drive-through windows are not permitted at dispensaries, provisioning centers, and there's no consumption of marijuana, alcohol, tobacco that is permitted on the premises. Uh, premise at all, all times, and this is, again, as Reed mentioned, a lot of this is, is defaults to state, but is open for any time for inspection, law enforcement, state, county, local, and whatnot. And security cameras are required and meet the Flint Project CAT I specs. And I think one positive to touch on that, that I saw uh, with the drafting of this is not only did you know, we work um, obviously with um, the Planning Commission and, and Council and uh, individuals who are advocates and adversaries in the community, we also work within many departments of the city, including had some very good discussions with the Flint Police Department um, on kind of their take and whatnot. So moving to growing and processing, like I said, we treat these as the same class. Um, we, you will see here, we limit the distance requirements a bit from the provisioning, and the rationale here is that these are not meant to be, nor should they ever be, um, if, they're, if they're single facilities, retail locations. Um, so 500 feet distance requirements from the schools, public parks, and places of worship. 300 feet from residential zoning districts. Um, there is no distance requirement from other marijuana facilities because if you co-locate, you know, we, how are you going to put a distance requirement? Um, and then in the zoning, as Reed mentioned, the industrial uh, mandate that is set forth by the state, the E, F, and G zoning district, which is all the, everything from light manufacturing, E, all the way to G, which is your heaviest manufacturing in the city of Flint where you can do almost anything. Uh, a couple more um, over a couple more pieces on the zoning regulations for the growing and processing. Um, if one growing center license, regardless of type A, B, or C, exists on site, it must be a minimum of 10,000 square feet. So the building, if you want to operate a growing center and obtain a growing center license, class A, B, or C, it mu the building must be a minimum of 10,000 square feet in size. If you have two or more, regardless of types of license, that are going to, as Reed mentioned, co-locate or be stacked within a facility, it must be a minimum of 30,000. So we're setting a ceiling, and I think this is you know, based on um, uh, many things, and, and you may have questions on how we came to this, many things that we've seen, we've both visited, and also the investment in these facilities, 10,000 square feet, as you guys know, is actually not that big for a commercial and an actual industrial use. Uh, provisioning or processing center size requirements. Again, any processing center license must be located in a facility that is a minimum of 10,000 square feet in size. And then again, if co-located, which they are permitted to be co-located both by the state and the city is choosing in this draft to do so, um, it would be a minimum of 30,000 square feet. Uh, some more on the growing and processing. The facility at no time is open to the general public unless there's a co-location element with a provisioning center. And if there is a co-location element of a provisioning center, 
It is explicitly stated both at the state and at the city and retouched on this. Separate entrances, they're treated almost as two separate uses within one facility. Can't have shared doors, can't have shared entrances. They're treated as almost two separate uses within one facility. Um, all marijuana must be contained in an enclosed locked facility. No consumption of marijuana, alcohol, tobacco permitted on the premises unless, co unless you co-locate and are, are lawfully co-locating, no dispensing or selling. So if you just own a grow operation or you just own a processing operation, you cannot distribute marijuana on site. You have to then also have that provisioning center to distribute marijuana on site. The premise is open at all times to inspection. And then as I noted, security cameras required and must meet the Flint Project CAT I specs. Uh, lastly, the testing and the transporting. And I will say, and, and from what we, Reed and I hear, and probably what you guys have, have encountered in, in, in your dialogue with others, is these seem to be not as um, popular as the provisioning, growing centers and processing. Um, but for what that's worth, the distance requirements very similar to growing and processing 500 feet from public parks, schools, and places of worship, 300 feet from residential zoning districts. No restriction on other marijuana centers and in, located only in the EFG zoning districts. Um, and on that point, if you go right back, and I'll give it to Reed, I think this is important and it's, it's covered extensively in the state laws. Uh, if you are a secure transporter, you can have no affiliation with any grow processing or provisioning center. So they, you can have no dual. Um, interest or assets aligned with, um, they're trying to completely separate the transporter element from the growing processing and provisioning. And those are spelled out not only in the ordinance here, but spelled out extensively in the state and the state um, legislation. So to, to close it out, I'm gonna turn to Reed. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so as we kind of alluded, as Kevin referenced earlier, uh, in the draft that's before you, uh, the, the current proposal put forward by staff is that uh, the city would grandfather, if you will, the current locations that exist lawfully under the city's current provisioning center ordinance. Uh, so grandfather locations specifically uh, would be any previously permitted and lawfully operating provisioning center granted approval under the city's provisioning center ordinance, the prior ordinance, and, and this is important, upon successful uh, LARA approval to retain legal non-conforming rights if applicable. So that would mean that as a grandfathered location, the, the site would not be permitted to make uh, structure, structural changes or expand because that would trigger a loss of the uh, legal non-conforming use rights under the city's zoning ordinance, but they would be permitted to continue to operate. Uh, but it's key that these uh, grandfathered operations uh, would be pending state approval. So we do have 13 uh, special regulated uses that have been granted by the city under the old provisioning center ordinance. All 13 of those would have to uh, apply to the state of Michigan and receive a state license in order to be eligible because obviously under the um, MMFLA, two licenses are required, specifically a city license as well as a state license. Any of these facilities uh, operating without a state license after uh, June, I believe, 15th of this year are, uh, are illegal. The sites are allowed to continually operate during this uh, adopting period, given that the city has stated that we do intend to issue a, an opt-in ordinance. Uh, but if their license is denied or if it is not granted by the state by June 15th, then those sites would not be able to uh, operate continually on a temporary basis. They would require a state license specifically. Um, Fairly to become compliant within six months, uh, would result in revocation of the grandfathered location as well uh, because there are some uh, additional requirements, um, non-locational requirements that need to be submitted to the city for the, for the provisioning centers under this new ordinance uh, that were not in place under the old ordinance. And so six months was granted uh, to give them time to get up to speed but not operate uh, continuously without uh, complying with the, with the city's opt-in ordinance. And then last, no previously approved cultivation facility will be eligible to be grandfathered in. Uh, and that is specifically because, uh, well, A, we don't have, we, I believe one, one was approved, but it is not open. And given that February 15th has passed, the, uh, the opportunity to temporarily or continually operate has also passed. Um, 
and, uh, and more importantly, the old ordinance, while it had some allowance for cultivation, was not on the scale or really the same type of license as the growing licenses that are being permitted by the state now. Uh, so the only grandfathering we're talking about are the provisioning centers that, that exist today. So under the proposed ordinance, there's also a process for the transferring of licenses, uh, because that's not something that was necessarily anticipated under the prior ordinance, and, uh, and, and that's something that's important for, uh, the, for the businesses, these, these licensees, to know uh, what they can and cannot do as far as transferring their business and what's required of them when it comes to review by the city if they seek to do so. So um, under the proposed ordinance before you, um, the licensees are permitted to, uh, are, are granted, the permits are granted to an individual, not to the location. Uh, so any changes to the permit, including a change of ownership, require a certain level of approval. So first, if the original applicant is going to retain some ownership interest, but take on partners, one or more partners, um, and there's going to be no changes to the building, the floor plan, the layout, then that approval can be done administratively upon paying the, the fee and getting uh, background checks on these new partners as if they would under with a new employee as well. Um, if the ownership is going to be transferred completely, a wholesale, if you will, um, uh, but there will be no modifications that occur at the site, uh, then a public hearing would be required uh, before the planning commission, but not the site review process. So essentially it would be the public hearing to attest to the fact that there will be no changes whatsoever to the actual uh, business itself. It's simply a transfer of ownership and also, of course, subject to those background requirements. And then last, uh, any transfer that results in modifications to the site or the operation will be treated as a new applicant and required to follow the full process of approval, including site plan reviews and reviews by the uh, city staff, uh, including uh, planning, BSI, fire, police uh, for background, and so forth. Additionally, one thing that was not in the prior ordinance that we think uh, would serve the city and potential investment well is an appellate process for these locations uh, because as Kevin touched on earlier there there are distance requirements for certain sites and for for instance a thousand feet from schools parks and churches for provisioning centers actually carries over that was in place for the prior ordinance as well uh, but in the event that you have an individual whose site uh, for instance falls 998 feet from from a park uh, they could potentially appeal, they could appeal a location uh, not listed on the map that planning has put out, or planning will put out, uh, pending adoption of this ordinance, um, developed by planning and zoning as far as eligible sites. So it would be a $5,000 fee, uh, and that would be non-refundable, and that gives the applicant the opportunity to appeal that uh, location to the planning commission for approval or for denial. There's no guarantee that that site would be granted, but it, it would be heard by the Planning Commission, and the individual would have to demonstrate an undue hardship and prove that special and unique conditions pertaining to the piece of property in question are warranted uh, for a variance to be granted. So that appellate process really allows for some flexibility uh, for exceptional circumstances, but I do want to stress that these are for exceptions and not the rule, and, uh, and we have no intention of creating um, site requirements and distance requirements that, that are not to be enforced. Uh, so, but, but it is a, a relief a valve for those truly exceptional circumstances. And then uh, as far as local revenue, um, we are looking at, this is a proposed a local application fee that's non-refundable of $1,500. The annual license fee is capped by the state at $5,000 for the city, and, and that is what we propose. Uh, slight site plan review fee of $1,002. Annual inspections may, may have fees as well, but those have not been determined as of yet. Uh, the, like, as I referenced, there's the locational appellate fee uh, for a hearing before the Planning Commission, and then there's annual state revenue, and that's one of the uh, key portions of the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, and, and really one of the driving factors for the city choosing to opt in if this body uh, agrees with that approach, and that is because what the state is doing is essentially they're charging the, the tax on the marijuana that is sold to patients at the provisioning centers and creating uh, an excise fund that is then distributed uh, to the, in part to the communities that choose to opt in. 
So if a city opts not to opt in, which is totally its right to do so, they simply would not get a, a portion of, of those uh, fees that are collected at the state level. I can't stand here today and tell you what exactly those numbers would be. There have been uh, predictions that have varied greatly, um, but, but it is revenue that is allocated under the Michigan Medical uh, Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, and being op opting in uh, would make Flint eligible to receive a share of that revenue. And uh, so, so last, I, I do just want to uh, wrap up the presentation, and then of course we are happy to answer any and all questions uh, by this body. I, I do want to state that the draft before you is the result of months of work from city staff that included input not only from legal and planning, but also from the police department, the fire department, and be, uh, building safety and inspections, uh, as well as local advocates uh, on the matter. And we did also look at um, other municipalities across Michigan as well as other states uh, that have chose to opt in in a similar format like Colorado. Um, and then the intention of the draft before you is to really balance, uh, one, emphasize the thorough review process to make sure that the businesses uh, that apply are legitimate and, and, can, and uh, can last and be a true investment in the community, and also really try to reconcile what I would call as two competing interests. Uh, the first being, uh, limited city resources when it comes to the administration of this ordinance and enforcement, but also encouraging investment in our industrial zones and uh, creating jobs and revenue both locally and as I referenced before through the, through the opt-in funds uh, from the state down the road. And so uh, Kevin and I are happy to take questions now, but I would also bring to your attention, uh, we do have uh, Captain Colin Burney and Deputy Chief Devin Bernritter from the police department to answer you any of your questions or concerns when it comes to this ordinance's effect on public safety. And if this body would be so willing, I would ask if they could ask um, those, those individuals their questions first so that they do not have to stay for the entirety of this hearing. Thank you, Attorney Erickson and Mr. Schrantz. At this time, we will open questions up for the council. Mm -hmm. I have uh, Monica, Kate, Herb and then May Mays. So we'll start with Monica. And if we can, do we have questions first for our police officers before uh, we start in on any others? Yeah, whether we um, have questions, I'll, I would like to hear what they have to say first. Okay. Would if they either have one like to they address? Would like to say. Good afternoon. Um, I spoke with Chief Johnson about this topic. We've talked several times over the last couple of months in the development of this plan. And I talked with him this afternoon and I said, what message do you want me to bring from the Chief's office to City Council during this conversation? And I think Mr. Erickson wrapped up a good portion of our thoughts there at the end. Um, the police department recognizes and understands the importance of bringing business and jobs to the city of Flint. The development of the areas that are discussed in this proposal is something that we have needed for decades. That being said, the proposal in front of you, make no bones about it, is illegal federally. And that brings with it many concerns for both the business owners and those participating in the business in that the federal government and all of the resources of the federal government do not recognize this as being a legal enterprise. And there are a lot of issues built into that with banking and taxation that brings us to need things like security teams and secure transport. And those are issues that are being addressed across the country. This is not an issue that will just be faced by the city of Flint. We, will, we also have some concerns, though I don't know to what degree because we can't see into the future. Um, we do recognize that this is going to bring an increased burden in enforcement and in inspections to an already struggling police department 
when it comes to the amount of workload that we are faced with. Um, there are dollars that are built into this project uh, for enforcement operations and for things that are happening at the local level. But I think that while we don't know exactly what those numbers are, the numbers will not equal a police officer. And the burden that this may carry is greater than that. Again, we recognize that it may carry no burden. There may be no issues. But from a public safety standpoint, we have to at least consider the fact that there may be some that we are going to have to deal with. And if that does become the case, we will be coming back before you looking for some relief in that area, in uh, the area of staffing, manpower, and budgetary resources. So that is something that you do need to consider. But I guess I will uh, close in the same way that we open. The need for business development and jobs in this community we cannot look past and this may potentially be an opportunity for that that is up for you to consider um, the city of Flint police department stands behind your decisions and we're ready to take care of whatever it is that you need to take care of in the interim and we can answer any specific questions that you might have thank you madam deputy chair. Chair. actually madam chair can we go in the order that you shared? Sure. Okay. I wasn't sure if those who had raised their hand were wanting to talk specifically to the police, but Monica, do you want? Do you have a question for yes, Mr. Bernard? Um, first of all, Chief Bernritter, I want to thank you because you identified the majority of my questions. Um, and and one of the one of the questions that I have for you first. Um, for the those that are making the presentation is um, and Chief Bernard, I don't know if you can answer have you researched crime in distressed communities where this sort of ordinance is being implemented I've not done any sort of research but I guess I can say this ma'am um, the presence of marijuana, medical or otherwise, call it whatever it is that you wish, is here. We are simply looking at changing the process by which people obtain it and use it and the penalties or lack of penalties that they could by the method that they would. If this body says, no, we are not doing this, and stands up and walks out, there will be marijuana in the city of Flint. And I don't think that this will change any of that. The concerns that we've had around tables and in discussions, and I don't think that there is anyone that will dispute that, no matter, this, no matter what side of the, t the issue that they fall on, and I am not making a team on this. But one of the issues that is in front of this community and all others that are involved in these decision-making processes is that because of the lack of recognition at the federal government level, it is forcing an industry that is going to be making a lot of money to not have the protections that, say, if you made the same amount of money and you owned a Burger King would have. You can't take your proceeds at the end of the day and walk into a bank and say, here's my money to deposit in my account that I earned by selling medical marijuana. And that causes a lot of, that potentially could cause a lot of issues in that places where there are large amounts of cash, places where there are large amounts of valuable assets, whatever those happen to be, are targets for those who would want to do something criminal to take possession of that. Right. Um, but I don't think that there's any illusion 
that this is going to bring marijuana to the city of Flint because marijuana is here. And I just want to say um, you are absolutely correct. Um, I, there was a presentation from um, at the Michigan Municipal League and in their um, their conference in August. And one of the things that the, the person that did the presentation shared is there's no question that it's there. But, and she was um, identifying Colorado. She's worked through Colorado. She was all for it. But what she said is once it was legalized, as opposed to in the dark, they saw an increase of child deaths because the edible products, and I know they changed this, but the edible products looked like the gummy bears. They looked like certain things. Um, and so I'm not negating that that it's there, but I wonder if the legalization of it changes that. And then two, um, you made a very good point because it's illegal on the federal level. And I understand that the federal government, President Obama put in place that the DEA would kind of allow the states to kind of regulate themselves. Yet at the same time, they've given themselves the ability to enforce if they need to because they realize that, you know, we still want to be able to do it. So with the fact that they can't take their money to the bank, has there been any research on what they can do? Because some of these organizations could be large. Some of them will be doing things the right way, which will cause them to have a, a really good following, if you will. Their clientele will grow. Um, and then when you have the armored car or however they keep their money because they can't take it to the bank, um, what do we do in a community if we do say yes to this? And you come before us and you say, we need more police officers. And we look at revenue that the state finally sends down to us and it's not enough, enough to compensate that. What options do we have at that point? If we ever get to the point, and Reed, I want you to be considering this too, because in the, from a legal point aspect, once we decide that we're going to open this door and we realize that we can't control it and we don't have the financial resources to give um, Deputy Chief Burn Ritter and the Flint Police Department what they need to do it and the state, as much as they say they're going to be there, they're not there. What provisions are in this ordinance that says, based on public safety, we have the ability to do something different. Because that's a valid point. I don't have a problem with looking at this. But what I don't want is a speculative investment. Because I can tell you who is going to benefit is any of those that are going to be doing it legally. And I don't have a problem with that. But if we find ourselves in a dangerous situation, where we can't protect this community. Crime is increasing, theft is increasing. What are we putting in this ordinance that allows us to say, you know what? We let you guys have 20 of them, but based on the last two years or one year and research and everything that's come in, we can't do this. What is our legal obligation and do we have the right to say, based on the last five, the last 10, um, we, we gonna have to, we gonna have to shut it down. Do we have that in here? And, and do we need to look at that? Because I'm willing to look at anything, but if we don't have a way to reel it in and protect the residents, then this is for not. Madam Chair, could I ask Mr. Burnwitter a question? Can, can we let Mr. Erickson, uh, uh, this is for both of them. Yeah, go ahead and answer that, and then we'll. Thank you, and I and and I and and, and, and I'll wait for the other round after everybody asks Chief Burnritter. I'd like to. Um, if so, that's okay. So you're you're good with him waiting right now? I can wait for um, the attorney. Absolutely, okay. and let everybody. Ask. I just want you to be thinking about it because that's that's huge. So I'm done with Chief Burnritter. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, Ms. Fields? Anyway, my question does involve the police, planning, uh, building inspection, uh, quite a few. Here's my question. I want to reference uh, this ordinance, page, page 3, number 17, the last sentence, which says, A non-commercial location used by a primary caregiver to assist a qualifying patient connected to the caregiver through the department's marijuana registration process in accordance with the MMM Act is not a provisioning center for purposes of this ordinance. Now, the reason I brought this up is it looks like our ordinance covers very well and really supplies a regulatory framework for uh, growing, processing, and provisioning. But where I'm getting complaints, and I have talked about this in uh, council committee meetings before, I'm getting complaints from residential neighborhoods where you have someone who has a caregiver permit for, I don't know, 72 plants, but the reality is they're growing far more plants and they have a regular business. The neighbors are complaining because there's steady traffic. They're obviously illegally selling their product. And the reason I say building code enforcement and police is because I've made these complaints and I was told the police had to kind of wait until this played out so we could see what our ordinances would be because we weren't clear with the new state law, etc. So they wouldn't address it. And um, code enforcement sent someone out because the guy has built 10 foot fences, this one particular one, 10 foot fences, which are illegal. Okay, he's been cited, but I don't know if our magistrate is hearing any citations. Okay, so that's kind of useless. Um, you know, trying to satisfy these residents, who so I don't blame them. They don't want uh, what is, in essence, a commercial uh, enterprise going on next door to them. So this doesn't cover that primary caregiver. I want to know now. What is the police, what are you prepared to do now that we have, and of course it's not approved yet, but once it is, okay, once we have this framework, what are you prepared to do to go and investigate where they are obviously violating the primary caregiver? Because none of this ordinance uh, addresses that, that I could see. You know, I went through it pretty quickly. And so I know that, or I assume um, that you've talked about the zoning and that provisioning is not allowed in commercial residential zones, but it's happening. So what are you all going to do and how are we going to get this actually addressed, including the 10 foot fence, which it's still there. Everybody's ignoring this has been months and months and months. You know, there's the paperwork. And then there's the reality of how things are operating, and there's yes, a dysfunction. Yes, Point of information. Mr. Mays? Do Ms. Fields understand that that's residential caregiver houses, I think she referring to, versus what this ordinance is? Why, Mr. Mays, I think I just stated that. So, yes, I do understand that, but thank you for the clarification. Sure. The, you are correct. We at the police department here in the city of Flint um, and law enforcement in general in Genesee County, I can say because I'm specifically familiar with that and I would assume that it is the same all across the state. Because of the disparity between what the rules are, depending on what badge you wear, the courts have been uh, reluctant to really pick a side 
on this, if we bring a case, they absolutely have our back and will prosecute them. But because of the confusion and the gray area between what is the federal rules, what are the state rules today, what are the state rules as they develop, how is the city of Flint going to come in with an ordinance, um, we have been not on firm ground. What we have been hoping and what I uh, trust that the law department is going to provide for us and in our conversations, I am absolutely sure that that is the case, is that once we ratify an ordinance that is in conjunction with a new and firm state law, then we will be able to go forward with the prosecution of things that fall outside of that. Now our problem, and what comes to your, to your question, is that you are right, this only speaks to commercial level um, gross, and there is little to no regulation on the residential uh, caregiver grows that you're talking about. And there are a lot of those in the city of Flint. Yes, sir. And and I just want to hold for a minute because I don't want to lose this thought. So, Mr. Erickson, okay, why don't we have some provisions in here addressing what's happening Madam, out there in the neighborhoods? Madam Chair, point of information. Do, do the deputy chief have to leave? We were requested to deal with him first. We're now venturing into a whole area or ordinance different from this ordinance. So my point of information is to deputy chief Burnridge. How much time do you have? Because they didn't do the request. And sir, last time I said yeah, I have I as remember. much time as you need, that didn't really work didn't out work so well out. for me. But I will say this is an important issue. This is certainly um, something that a large swath of the community is interested in. So I will say once again, whatever it Thank is. Thank you for you your time. The, I, unfortunately, some of these issues, you can't separate out one from the other. They are connected. So, uh, Ms. Fields, I will tell you this. If you give me a law that the city of Flint has enacted, the city of Flint Police Department will enforce it. Oh, that's a great answer, and I'm happy to hear that. So. Ms. Ms. Fields, Mr. Erickson, yes? can we just, can you write that question down for uh, Mr. Erickson and then he'll get to Monica, then to you, write that down. So are you saying you want us to ask one question at a no, time? No, I'm saying let's just keep it to Mr. Burnreader, then he can go and then Mr. Erickson He's can He's just said up. he has all the time we need. I understand that, but I'd, I'd like to. I could just answer very okay. quickly if that would be an acceptable compromise. That is compromise. fine, thank you. Okay, so good, bad, or ugly when it comes to the state law that was enacted when it comes to the MMFLA. What it did not do is repeal the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act that was passed in 2008. That is the act that creates the system for caregivers and for um, patients where you have X amount of plants up to the number, based on the number of patients that are registered for you as a caregiver. The reason that this ordinance does not touch on that is because the state law, when it comes to these, this um, system, does not touch on that either. The states had the opportunity to get rid of the old model and did not do so. So the old caregiver patient model, for the time being, will stay intact and in fact you will essentially have two parallel tracks, if you will, where you have the provisioning centers and the commercial grow operations and then you have the, the local um, residential caregivers and patients and uh, I, I bring back to this body's attention specifically the Turbeet versus Village of Wyoming case where the Michigan Supreme Court did hold that a uh, the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act created rights that superseded the ordinance that prohibited the activities that were allowed under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. So that would be the biggest reason why we've not prohibited that at the ordinance level is because the Michigan Supreme Court has told the village of Wyoming that they couldn't do so. That may be frustrating from a law enforcement perspective. I, I, I have no... Well, staying on topic then, yes. so how does this ordinance, because we're giving the... A point of information. I do have a point of... Um, yes, Madam you. Chair, respectfully, I yielded the floor. I have questions for Mr. Reed as well. 
but I yielded the floor so that all of my colleagues can ask specific questions of Chief Bernritter. And then once Chief Bernritter is done, then we can speak, because I want to speak to Mr. Reed as well. And so I'm asking that how you set the precedent before would be enforced. Point taken. Uh, I'll have you write that question down and come back to that. Uh, going next on the list was uh, Mr. Or Herb. Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Winfrey. Uh, did you have a question for the deputy? I, I yield my time to any of my colleagues. Okay, uh, Mr. Mays. Uh, thank you, Chief Bernritter, for being here. Um, what's the relevant question I have at this time? We'll have plenty of time to get and communicate with you and the chief and the department. Yes, sir. But as I listened and I heard that you had worked with the different people bringing this ordinance, and I hear the concerns and I take them in seriously, did y'all look at any additional fees in order to get a person or a couple of persons in this ordinance fee structure wise? Because some fees wasn't capped. And ordinance wise, as we enter into this with the concern, you know, without taking away manpower, a particular department of person, that's what I'm concerned about. Did they work with you? And if not, then I'm looking at the fee schedule based upon a particular officer or officers. Did that come up in your discussions? We talked about it at length. And part of the issue in coming to a definitive answer is that the numbers as they flow out of the state's hands and into the local municipalities, um, we, had, we ran into two issues. First, we don't know how much it will be and there is a significant concern that it won't land all the way down at the local level that it is probably going to land at the county level or at the state level and the police department's issue with that is in as much if one of your constituents has an issue and you call me, my job is to resolve that for you. If all of the money is at the county level to make that resolution, then it is still on us. I'm not gonna go to the sheriff and say, one of our council people has a constituent's concern. The city of Flint Police Department is gonna take care of the city of Flint. And so we have concerns. We don't know what the numbers are. So we have left it, our reliance on the legal department and the crafting of the ordinance with this body to understand that we acknowledge this may not be a blip on our radar in crime or issues or workload going forward. We also in the same vein acknowledge that it might be a significant increase and we won't know until we're there and if we're there and we have not prepared for it, it is not going to be pretty for let us. Me, let me say this if I may, Madam Chair. I wouldn't care if your thought was one person or two person equipment, whatever is needed. I would ask that proactively work a budget, a person, whether we put the fees into the um, ordinance and craft it that way as we look at it. I see some loopholes for funds. And if not, the minute we enact it, then we'll have to go back to the general fund or something and fund that. So my request is proactively give, I would like some figures brought forward on whether it's one person, whoever, because even with the um, background checks, I know Captain um, Bernie just did one. All of that takes up time. I have a and captain of police that does background checks yeah, for this, which it's gonna be is some, not the most effective way to do this. It's, say it, that again. It is not the most effective way to do this. What is not the most? Having a captain perform a task. Right. That so that's why I want to know, work me a budget, a person, or whatever level it be. And, you know, I know about what an officer costs. I don't know what the experience would be. But I would like to see a budget proactively from the department and as we shape the fees and or when we pass it, if it passed, 
snatch from the general fund, that's the communications I want to have with the department. In meetings before, you have asked me how many officers I need. I know My that's the difference. Is 100, <laughs> and it yeah. stays 100, but for the purposes of this discussion, uh, I believe what the chief said is four officers and an administrative aide, like a clerk. Four and officers and an administrative aide. Thank you. Valid point to Mr. Mays' question. So you are correct. The city is capped at an annual license fee, and but we are able to do impose annual inspections if it's public safety, building and safety. That fee schedule has not been developed, and that will eventually come to you. Yeah, I want to go back to the order, but I just wanted to ask him that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Griggs. No, I don't. I don't have a question for Devin. Okay. It's uh, it's Ray, uh, Reed. Okay. Any other questions? Devin has explained perfectly well. Okay, great. Thank you. I think we can go back now to the original order. Monica, you want um, Mr. Erickson, and thank you, Mr. Bernritter, for being here. Ms. Galloway, you did ask one question before um, when you were discussing the re <clears throat> I think where you were getting was repealing of the entire law or the entire ordinance if we get into trouble going down the road, and I won't get into Reed's area, but I will say that in conversations in crafting this, um, I said repeatedly, we can't just bark on this. you got to put some teeth in the dog, and if there is an issue with a particular location, we need to craft this in such a way so that license can be pulled for that particular location. I know you were leaning towards maybe pulling the whole thing in that discussion with Mr. Erickson, and I'll let him get into that. But I will say that um, the law department was very receptive to my concerns and my request on if we get into trouble with a particular licensee and they have built um, the appropriate penalties and, and things into the ordinance as it sits for us to address that. The police department is comfortable with that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. You bet. Thank you. Okay, Reed, I have a couple of questions for you. And and he, I appreciate um, Deputy Chief Bernritter um, because, Reed, I'm wondering um, from a legal standpoint, um, do we have the ability to put some repeal language as it relates to public safety specifically? And and the reason why the reason why I say that is because um, I can appreciate the federal level. Um, because as much as everybody is saying that this is going to be the best thing, right? They recognize that this has the ability to spiral. And why am I saying that? Because you always believe possibly that things can go well, but but as much as we don't, it seems like we're trying to ignore substance abuse is real, and abuse means abnormal use. And although the people doing it have the best of intentions, right, the reality is it is said that when something is more easily um, accessible, overindulgence happens. Because we, we looked at it for, because um, I, I, last time we were talking about marijuana, there was somebody passing out a thing saying, legalize this like alcohol. But what we saw with alcohol, when it wasn't legalized, people did it, but there was like this, you know, kind of low whatever. Once it was legalized, we came up with all kinds of things that we never thought we'd see, right? And so I'm just wondering, can you look at that to see if legally, because ultimately we're using this as a um, creation of jobs, economic development, all of those things that sound great, especially when you're in a distressed city, we want whatever, you know, maybe this is the, I'm hearing, and maybe you guys ain't, I'm hearing, this is, this is the next thing that, that we can do that's like a General Motors, literally. All of those spots that General Motors held, you know, we can, all these jobs. But my question is, all of that is for naught if we still can't keep the community safe. And so I'm not Point of information. I don't know. Uh, Mr. Griggs. Point of question. Point of no, point of order or point of okay, information. Okay, this is not about addiction. 
This is about the state that's not, medical marijuana. That's not, that's and it's not, not about the point of information. That's not about the federal law. You're talking about people addicted, and this is not an addiction. Mr. Mr. Griggs, when it's your turn, you can you can state that. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Reed, I'm just wondering, can you look into that and see if that has the ability um, to be done? The question, the next one that I has is, um, you said that, I think Chief Bernritter said that the, the dollars funnel to this county, right? Okay, so if the dollars funnel to the county, my question would be, and you don't have to get these today. Sure. I just want you to be, you know, you don't have to answer them today. I don't think you can, but I, I, I want to get them on the record because um, I, I can go back to the tape. But... If, if it is funneled to the county, and I hear that they're going to get a, a large amount, would there be a precedent set if Grand Blank only has one, Burton has two, and Flint has 13, 20, right? So a, a, a proper portion of the police presentation, if you will, I think if that's the question. Um, and then I have some a clarity question, if I can read on the um, law, the Supreme Court ruling Beak versus Wyoming. Turbeak, yes. Turbeak. It said um, prohibiting any use contrary to federal or state law. And so my question is, you're speaking a lot about state law, but was would there have been protection? for that community under federal law because if federal law is not really playing with this because Chief Burnritter is saying part of our issue is there's everybody's trying to figure out what their role is. Right. So would there have been any protection right. under the federal level? So Councilman, you're correct that uh, I can answer two of the three questions. The first question as to whether we could have a wholesale repeal provision in there. I, I don't have, we don't have a provision like that right now, like the deputy chief said. Uh, we did put teeth in there for nuisance locations that are site specific. But as for the wholesale repeal, I imagine this body could repeal the licenses since it's an opt in. How the state would treat that and how we would phase out those licenses is, is uh, uh, something I can't discuss in detail right now, but it, it could be an option uh, for this body. Um, when it comes to the funding for the county and the the city, it, it will be split. It's broken up. Um, Sixty percent goes locally, and the other forty percent is uh, to the state and their state police and so forth. Um, Twenty-five percent is would go to the municipalities that opt in. Uh, Thirty percent to the counties, and that's set by the state statute. So. Uh, nothing that the city does and then five percent to the county sheriff so in effect the counties are getting 35 percent and and the cities the, the municipalities townships that opt in are, are getting 25 percent uh, i believe that that's going to be proportionate to the licensing in so more licenses in one community should yield a higher share than as you said if grand blank just has one uh, but that's still something that's being clarified by the state and we don't have a fund yet because this process hasn't begun the licenses haven't been issued so in in many respects the state is still building this as the city is uh, but those percentages are set at least so we do know the county well no I, I i know that they had percentages but right. my question is the police presence i see um i don't can, okay can you check that and sure. then my last question that i have for you is um I don't understand the one where you said the federal protection. No, the um the distance. I didn't understand. I just want to try and put it in my mind. There was some that had a distance of only 500. Um and by a school or a public park. And so, can you give me an example like if I'm if my baby is at a school, right? Which one of, which, what could possibly be only 500 feet from them? So, there, there, 
the ones that are 500 are growing and processing, and there's a rationale for the difference because we think those buffers likely won't be triggered because growing and processing are restricted specifically to industrially zoned areas regardless. So you're going to have those schools in, uh, predominantly in your residential areas, and you're only talking E, F, and G, and I don't mean to step on to Kevin's toes and when it comes to planning and zoning, but uh, the provisioning centers are allowed in, are allowed in the in the retail, in, in the D, uh, in some of those D zones. So there you have a more likelihood of being potentially adjacent to a school, park, or church, so you have a thousand feet. Uh, but the growing and the processing are restricted exclusively to industrial zoned uh, districts where it's, it's far less likely that you're going to be adjacent to a school, let alone within 500 feet or a thousand feet. Uh, so we did keep that distance requirement in there, uh, but that was the rationale for, for, for the difference. So that was, you guys mirrored that from somebody? You, that's how it's mirrored on the state level, is that what you guys are saying? So the current ordinance for provisioning centers is a thousand feet. If we go back in, you can go back to the provisioning center. So that, that aligns very similar to what is currently in place, mm -hmm. except for the residential requirement, which mm -hmm. we added. Mm -hmm. And that was a result of you know, this, this term NIMBY, not my backyard, which many people don't care about having uses until it hits in their backyard. So we, we feel like that residential requirement is a result of the past years of dealing with 30 to 40 provisioning center cases. But those thousand feet buffers for the retail operations, strictly provisioning, align with what is currently on the books in the city. The only difference is currently they're allowed in D3 and D4 districts, D5, D6, E, F, and G. We got rid of D3 and D4 because those are neighborhood residential or neighborhood commercial areas. Good example, um, Civic and um, uh, Welch and Chevrolet or Court Street and Franklin. Everyone's got them. Flip is built around these walkable communities. Those are typically D3 and D4 districts surrounded by residential. D5 and D6 typically are not surrounded by residential. So we feel like that's a result. We don't think they should be next to residential. It's a retail option, whatnot. So those, those are similar. The 500 feet is off of other ordinances. And every community differs, but I think today we've probably looked at you know, six different states, and probably even within Michigan, I'd say we're up, upwards of around 30 draft ordinances. Everyone does it differently. But so I think Kevin, this is in, very our, in, in our area, do we have an example of this 500? And I'm just, the reason why I'm saying it is because um, I, I still don't get a visual. I was hoping that you could give me, I know you said the door highways and everything, right? That's what you were saying, that 500 corridor, or the reason why that 500 would be there. I just was wondering, since it has school or, or um, park, would, the, would it be a, a better assessment to just do a blanket? I don't know. What With the 100, the 1,000 feet. The, the 1,000 for every one? Right. I mean, why, why, sure. why did you guys deem that? You know what, we, we can do 500, 500 on this, but that, yeah, instead of just doing a, yep. a blanket for all of them. So I, I think, uh, generally speaking, we did that because we only permit growing and processing in industrial areas. Okay. And those... So generally there's no schools. We don't... Did you look at our demographics to make sure that there were no schools in those? Correct. Well, okay. it's not only just schools, right? But I so, think... Well, I mean, yeah. Typically, in city, the city, in, in the city, this dates back, and I think it's important to tell. The last time the city updated zoning code was 1974. So, similar to the master plan that was done in 2013, it's been a okay. long time. There's a lot of spot zoning, which is not healthy for any community. Okay. To to do spot zoning, um, but the E, F, and G generally are James P. Cole, Stewart, Buick City, uh, North Door. I mean, Delphi East, heavily. Generally speaking, are on the east, mid to east side of town. Not much industrial is on the west and north side of town. Um, but we feel like the 500 feet is a, is a good compromise because E, F, and G, um, you're not going to have schools, especially now. Unfortunately, it's easy to count the number of schools we have in the community as well. And Kevin, are we going to have a presentation from um, those that are not for medical marijuana. A lot of my colleagues asked that question when we were doing the um, charter revision. They were saying a lot of the presentations were pro-charter sure. and that we didn't have anybody that came and broke down the cons sure. of the charter. 
Are we going to have a, a, a balanced presentation of some of the things that have been researched out or or no? I mean, I know we're, you know, but have you guys looked at that? So I think it's worth noting, we've never sponsored nor will we sponsor a presentation from an advocate of medical marijuana. Obviously, they can speak um, their turn, insight into this, uh, the content of this was from both sides of the aisle. And then subsequently, this is not us, staff advocating at all, regardless of personal opinion, for, for or against medical marijuana. This is a direction that um, the moratorium that was you know, introduced to not all this body, but four of the members of this body currently, um, and the direction to staff was to move forward and opt in, and that's what we've done. So we, we are trying to craft what we feel like is the best ordinance I think we're also trying to craft an ordinance where we receive, we do receive these comments, Corey, myself, Reed, Suzanne, we receive comments from individuals who are totally against this. And when it goes in their backyard and they know it's gonna be there, they call. Uh, family video is a great example of that, um, as you probably remember. And um, so that we're trying to balance both and both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fields? Okay get back to my topic of the primary caregiver okay and the problems having this in residential areas because if you think in the seventh war they didn't like the family video I'm telling you in the neighborhoods they don't like this primary caregiver that's operating as if they were a provisioning center so I agree with Deputy Chief Bernritter about the needs to have teeth in it and I'm not denigrating the enormous amount of work that this ordinance took, but I don't think you're going far enough and I don't think you're gonna solve a lot of the problems that we're going to have coming up and that exists now. I think you're missing things. So I'll refer you to page five, okay? Provisioning center, uh, operation without license prohibited. Basically, if you don't have, and I think that's the right section, if you don't have this license as a provisioning center, you can hereby declare it to be a public nuisance. Well, whoop de doo what, what are the ramifications of being a public nuisance? So, uh, Councilwoman, actually, dis despite in the nomenclature sounding relatively ordinary, being a public nuisance um, can trigger significant ramifications for shutting down uh, a, um, an entity. So, for instance, when you, uh, I'm sure this body recalls, uh, some time ago we, we filed to shut down a, a liquor store that was declared public nuisance, uh, and when you do the chain and padlock, that's the sort of activity that can occur, uh, potentially be shut down and, and initiating forfeiture proceedings. Why isn't that language in here, specifically? What could happen, the ramifications? That has to be in here because, you know, I actually know individuals that are proud to be a public nuisance. Okay, so how, uh, you know, you ordinances, any law without teeth and without, you know, telling you the ramifications, um, they're just not very useful. And I know that when some of the advocates came and spoke to council, one of the things I asked was how will this new law and this new ordinance, how will this help prevent the problems that, that my constituents complain about? And, um, they said, oh, well, because if you, uh, number one, they'll be put out of business because the quality will be much better at the legal provisioning centers and the money will be cheaper, etc." Well, I ask you this, in order to buy marijuana from a provisioning center, what type of uh, card or license do you have to have and what does that cost? It's a state. Uh, card, right? To buy medical marijuana? To be a medical marijuana patient? Yes. Yes, that's issued through the state. And it costs how much money? I believe it's a hundred or two hundred dollars. Sixty dollars is what okay, I Okay, it's sixty bucks. For those people who don't have either the wherewithal, okay, to pay their sixty or the interest in filling out a form, another government form, which puts them on a particular database, why wouldn't those customers of the neighborhood guy who's doing it illegally uh, not be more uh, interesting to them or they can't get 
a, a legal medical marijuana card. What I'm asking for and what I'm looking for that is missing here is, number one, ramifications that have some teeth for violating these this, this regulatory framework for commercial, okay? Yes. And some type of language guarantee that would help us help the residents, the people in the neighborhoods that are paying their taxes, that are paying, you know, the salary of the police department, however pitiful our numbers are, et cetera, and your, your salaries, et cetera. Where is the language that's going to help them prevent these characters from turning their neighborhoods into drug zones? Right. Well, as, as to the, the, the illicit, the black market, I, I don't have a provision in here for that specifically, Councilwoman, but, but I would like to at least direct your attention to page 19 uh, for penalties. So that's subsection O and then subsection 2 specifically, which outlines the fact that um, individual violations of this ordinance is a misdemeanor subject up to a $500 fine plus the cost of prosecution. 90 days imprisonment or both, and of course as, as a municipal entity, we only have the authority through the ordinances to, to criminalize misdemeanors. We don't have any further criminal authority than that. Uh, under the state law, of course, if someone is operating without the necessary license under this statute or under the Medical Marijuana Act without their card, uh, they would be subject to criminal prosecution uh, like marijuana was treated for many years uh, prior to the enactment of the Marijuana Act. Um, so. I, I don't know if this is Thank what you. I, I had not, you know, I was going through this very quickly. I had not seen that. Okay, so let's take it a step further now. Yes. So let's say one of our police officers go out, or I don't know how we can get the county to respond. Okay, they issue a citation or missed me or whatever. Is this being heard by the regular district court, or is this within our magistrate, which I don't even know if they're operating yet, but it, it, the problem is... The citations we're seeing for mm -hmm. already existing stuff are not being addressed. So how is this going to be addressed? Who's going to address this? Sure. So this this would be a, a criminal misdemeanor, not um, not a civil infraction, which would be kind of the hearing officer avenue. So it, it would go to the district court uh, because uh, it would be very likely prosecuted by the city attorney's office. It's entirely possible that the, the, the county could prosecute it as, as a misdemeanor as well. Uh, but it would be prosecuted at the district court uh, like any of our criminal misdemeanor ordinances. Okay, thank you. And and one more question for, are you Deputy Chief Burnritter? Can't see you. Are you Deputy Chief now? Is that you? All right, congratulations. Uh, Today. So when I send you on your nice new form, your complaint form, I fill this out and send it to you tomorrow, and I give you the address of this one particularly egregious primary care giver, giver what is your department going to do? Well, I think that I can head that off of the pass by telling you the truth today. And the truth today is where we happen to stand as it relates to the primary caregivers that are operating under a state law and state licensure out of a residential structure in the city of Flint. That is very different than what we are discussing today in that the ordinance that you are looking at today will provide a set of rules where we will know who is legal, where they are, and provide us the ability to go in and assess, simply based on the ordinance, their compliance with the law. That's perfect as far as the police department is concerned. When we get into the residential bound home caregivers and the grows that can, are conducted legally under state law in the state of Michigan, in the city of Flint, we don't know where they are. There is no list that is available to law enforcement that says Joe Smith at 123 Annie Street is a licensed caregiver and has a grow in his house. So what we are forced to do is present to the courts in a criminal prosecution a suspicion that there is criminal activity afoot. We must be able to present to the courts 
when you hand me a piece of paper that says at 123 Annie Street, I believe that there is an illegal grow happening there. We can go and we can do all of the things that we as police officers do, surveillance, buys, traffic stops, and we can make a determination if marijuana is being sold out of that house. I'm very happy with your answer. I'm getting, you, I'm getting, to, I'm getting okay. to the part where you're not going to be happy. Once we do that, we have to go before court and say, here's what we found, and here's why it's illegal. And ma'am, I can't say it's illegal to a court, because it is just as likely in the environment that we are in, under the state law, that it is a legal operation as it is an illegal operation. I cannot go and say to a court, we bought illegal marijuana out of that house without knowing if they're licensed or not. And there's no list to tell us if they're licensed or not. I'm not going to go and tell my staff to kick in the door of a citizen's home who might be doing it correctly under this state law. But if you have a complaint with legitimate indications like a 10-foot fence, a very large backyard, plants growing in the basement, you know, I mean, you can tell there's more than 72 plants going. Complaints, you know, uh, drug pickups on the hour, every hour, that, and someone gives you an actual address, you can't follow up on that? I certainly can, and we certainly do, but I will rely on Tom Cruise when he said, it is not what I know, it is what I can prove. And I have to stand in front of a court and say, the marijuana being grown and distributed there is illegal. And they're going to, the judge is going to say, how do you know they don't have a license? And I'm going to say, I don't. And they're going to say, denied. And well, that you'll is know they won't have a provisioning center license, okay, have. because you'll have access to that. But are you telling me that the state, you have no way of saying, you know, Charlie Brown, do you, do you, does he have a... The state of Michigan will not release that information to law enforcement. I did not know that. And that is the rub. What they have crafted for the commercial stuff is perfect because it gives us inspection rights. It tells us who's legal. And if you're not on the legal list, then, well, you're illegal. There's no list. That is very interesting. And that is where, that is where we as law enforcement have been frustrated by these this the state that we are in because the community is asking us to do enforcement that we don't have the tools to do okay but at the very least we can go and make them tear down their 10-foot fence Ms. wilcox <laughs> yeah. the, the tarps and the fences that that we can probably take care of okay thank you very much thank you uh, mr winfrey yeah um to Kevin and uh, Attorney uh, Erickson, my concern is: Are we are we uh, confident that we have been clear on our definition of what a park is? Because I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's going to going to come up, and and, and and we don't we don't have to get it. There's just something to think about. And the other thing that I want to look at, too, is at this point, this ordinance seems like it's a working document because we have draft on it. So that means we're not done with it. Um, and then I guess finally, I, I, I've listened to uh, Deputy Chief Bernritter and certainly his, his, uh, his sentiments of, are of concern to this council person. But I, I, I think we need to set the record straight. When we start talking about medical marijuana, and, and Councilman uh, Griggs, you, you, you started. Uh, when we're talking about medical marijuana, we're not talking about marijuana with THC in it. It has absolutely no psychoanalytic effects on it. It is for, it is for healing. And it doesn't matter to me if a person is for or against it. We at least ought to have the facts right. And I don't believe that this medical, based on everything that I've seen, on meetings that I've been uh, involved in, I don't believe that the, and it seems like it's so when you listen to people talk, but I don't believe that the main focus or the main thrust of medical marijuana was to create revenue. I think the main thrust of it was 
to heal folks who have co-occurring disorders or, or, or multiple illnesses without having any side effects. And it's been proven, it's backed up by science. Now, again, you can be for it against or against it, but at least we ought to get our facts right. What are the facts about uh, uh, medical marijuana? It's different than recreational marijuana. Now, that's gonna be an issue coming down the road here in a few months or years. But when we talk about medical marijuana, this, this community, I encourage my colleagues as well to get educated about what medical marijuana is, its byproducts, what it is, and what it is not. And when you talk to me about medical marijuana, behavioral health is my field. Uh, so when you talk to me about medical marijuana, that's not the same as recreational marijuana. And, and so I, I just think that we need to, we need to, to distinguish between the two. Absolutely, Councilman. Um, to address your question very briefly, um, when it comes to parks, we, we did try to add more clarity to this draft than the, um, than the prior act, which uh, ordinance, which also prohibited, of course, um, the provisioning centers from being within a thousand feet of parks. And um, uh, you'll see on page two, it's, it clarifies that it's a dedicated public park, so it can be uh, city or privately owned property, but specifically that it uh, contains deed restrictions explicitly stating that the property is for the use for the general public for for leisure so that there's um, there's no ambiguity uh, about that because that is a concern that was raised to legal and planning a number of times under the prior ordinance and that is something that we're attempting uh, to correct here um, the draft status uh, it, it does say state this on here councilman we did want to bring this as soon as we had vetted it with administration to this body for feedback, any changes that, of course, the uh, the council thinks would be most prudent, and to get feedback, of course, from the community on the matter as well. Um, uh, not to get ahead of myself, but I believe uh, we will bring the formalized copy of this document pending any changes requested by this body to a standard uh, legislative committee hearing uh, coming up, and then it would go through the ordinary ordinance process from there. Uh, but um, other than some feedback that we've received since providing this document about uh, community impact for the license review process, uh, specifying that the Planning Commission should consider um, the number of local jobs and the impact on the surrounding neighborhood for any licensee before it as a factor, uh, I, I have no changes that I anticipate to this uh, document. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Okay, Mr. Mays. What did you say? It's your, you're all set for questions. Okay, thank you. What I want to do, I've been privileged to communicate. I learned something today about elected officials as it relates to these licenses that some of the folks didn't tell me who've been catering and, and telling me I could be a partner. I can't. And so that's new information. I had a group. <laughs> I had a group come to me. I was all excited, and so now I'm like they misled me. I can't be a partner. Ever since last year, before December, you know, people been taking me to dinner, talking. I've learned a lot under this new charter. Can't talk to them in the same way. You got some restrictions. But what I want to do, if I may, Madam Chair. I'd like to hear from attorney Brenda Williams and attorney Bruce Leach because those have been primary consultants for me as well as attorney Erickson and attorney Erickson has said to us in open meetings that he take information from wherever it comes. So if we get ready to look at this draft, I've had conversations with both attorneys and I want them to point out some issues with this ordinance if they have any. And so that's my request at this time to hear from attorney Bruce Leach and Brenda Williams. We have public comments at the this end. This is not public comment. This is Councilman Mays 
Long to hear from attorney Bruce Leach and Brenda Williams. Public comment is three minutes. Believe me, this ain't public comment. We will have a time for a public hearing, and we also have a committee Mr. meeting. Madam Chair, they have been working for weeks and months. I'm talking with them. And so what are you denying my request? Yes, this is I not the time or place for that. I would appeal that route. I mean, I know what I'm doing. Point of information. Yes. Uh, if these two individuals are the ones who have been whining and dining council people, uh, I know they're attorneys, but uh, have they filed the correct forms uh, regarding being lobbyists? Mr. Madam uh, Chair, I didn't lobby? say these two attorneys have whined and dined me, and I, I object. I, I just know said they if. Okay, to, one uh, at a time, please, Mr. Chair. I said if. Insinuation. I'm asking that they have been on record, Mr. Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Erickson. Have you been working with these two attorneys? Uh, we have received input from, from these attorneys, if, if I could elaborate uh, specifically. Um, at the time that we brought the proposed moratorium to the prior council, um, Councilman Mays and I believe one other formal council member at that time had requested that re we receive input from uh, these local advocate attorneys and pursuant to that request we did so. Um, I would not characterize, uh, first of all I have great respect for Mr. Leach and Ms. Williams and have spoken with them a number of times. Uh, I would not characterize them as city attorneys or uh, Mr. Directors. Mays. Tell her. Talk you, about people in I'm getting tired of That her. is completely Perfect. unprofessional okay. behavior. If I, you couldn't hear her? No. But you heard me. I did hear Okay, you. then let's get some open ears. Let's refrain she from making comments. Lie. Excuse me. What you heard, you didn't hear her, you heard me, and you didn't interrupt it. Just let's keep moving, because you didn't deny the request that I'm going to fight for. First of all, is there a second yeah, to the second. appeal to the chair? Second. That was what was in order. Okay, we're gonna do uh, a roll call for no, that. We're gonna discuss it first. Oh, discussion, please. Any discussion, Miss Swinton? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, with all due respect, one of our colleagues had made a request to hear attorneys. Now, I was somewhat. Um, disturbed by the term that these attorneys uh, have whined and dined me or uh, uh, dined some of us and I'm telling you and all who are in earshot I don't think I've been whined As a matter of fact I know I haven't been whined and dined I don't even drink I don't wine and so and the point that I'm trying to make is it is the chair's responsibility and the chair's right to grant our colleague his wish but it, it, we've set a precedent that when a colleague requests such, we, we, we've been doing that in the past. And that, that's all I have to say. Any other okay. discussion? Yeah. Oh, Miss Murphy Carter's next. And I would also like to hear from attorney Brenda Williams and attorney Leach. So I, I think we should be granted to do so. I would like to hear what they have to say about this. They and are specialists in, in the area, and I would like to hear from them. Any other discussion? Yeah. Mr. Mays. I've attended planning commission meetings with Attorney Williams and um, Mr. Leach. They filled me in. That's who I um, talked to. And when I say lunch, dinner, or whatever, that's what I mean, and, and we'll continue to do it. When Miss Fields say wine and dine, she always trying to discredit and do stuff with folks, and particularly me, Mr. Gilchrist, and others. And it's getting sickening. It's getting sickening. I mean, these are strong allegations, and I'm just getting tired of her, but I'm right appealing your ruling because Mr. Winfrey, President Winfrey, is right. If we want to get ready to vote on an ordinance, and we got people who've been involved in it, reputable in the community, we've known them for years. This is council. 
we can hear from Mr. Erickson, we can hear from Kevin Straub, planning. I wish some planning commissioners was here. I see one, um, that commissioner sitting there, I might want to hear from him. Tell me the name, six ward planning commissioner. Mr. Rob Jewell. You see, I'm getting old, Rob. We've known each other for 20 years. And that's how I'm going to deal with it on the time that I want to deal with it. I might want to hear from Mr. Jewell because I'm going to shake and vote on an ordinance. How dare you say we came here in our meeting who we want to hear from. So, Mr. Griggs, I'm going to appeal to you. I wouldn't care if we was discussing engineering. If you want to hear from an engineer, you get to hear from them. So it's six of us here. It's going to take five yes votes to overrule that we can hear from who we need to hear from, Madam Chair. So I don't appreciate you denying any request. If it was somebody from a provisional center here, I want to hear from them. I'm going to vote on a very high profile ordinance. With all due respect, Mr. Mays, uh, this meeting was for Mr. Schrantz and Mr. Erickson, our, I got that right, right, okay, <laughs> uh, to present to us the draft ordinance. There is time afterwards for anyone to speak publicly. As you had stated, uh, you had been taken out to dinner, those were your words, and have been able to speak with such uh, then I don't see why we need to hear and ask questions in this forum as this is city business and that is an outside opinion. Uh, and that, those are my comments on the matter. Can we, do we need to take a roll call? Madam Clerk or just all in favor? Do a show of hands or a roll call. Okay, let's do show of hands. In support of? In support of the appeal to the ruling of the chair. Hold up, point of information. Support of would mean that your ruling stands. Against would mean your ruling fails. Would that be a fair statement? Or oh, how do that vote? The vote? yes vote would be that I win the you, appeal. Okay. Yes. All in favor? Say aye. Raise your hand, please. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, Mr. Mays. Uh, we shall hear from Ms. Williams. And uh, Attorney Leach. It will come as no surprise to this body that uh, Mr. Leach and Ms. Ms. Williams are active uh, advocates and medical marijuana attorneys in the area. Uh, they, they may have insight and expertise as Councilman Mays has stated. Um, again, no surprise to this body, but for the record, they do represent local clients, of course, as all private attorneys do, uh, who may have interest in this legislation. Again, that's not to say that their opinions are by any means invalid and their ideas are not good. I just wanted to put that into the record for, for this council. Thank you, Attorney. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Councilman Mays. Uh, my name is Bruce Leach. I'm a local cannabis attorney. Uh, my practice is entirely devoted to uh, the furtherance of cannabis law and understanding and business development. Um, I represent many clients who have significant uh, interest and desire in investing large sums of money into these business operations in the city of Flint. And uh, I've listened to uh, some very good points brought up by all these council members tonight, and I have a few items that I would just like to touch on and, and go through. Um, first of all, you know, I, while I understand the law enforcement's concern with the gray area and the caregiver program, that's not what we're here talking about tonight. This is for the regulation of commercial businesses. And let's take a first look at who are the people that are applying for these businesses. Um, you can't have any criminal record of any kind. You have to have a legitimate source of significant funding uh, in the, to the tunes of millions of dollars available to invest into these businesses. And similar to uh, someone that owned a, a bar establishment, they're not going to sell a $2 beer to a 15-year-old and lose their liquor license and do something silly that would then uh, invalidate their million-dollar investment and all the hard work and, and effort that they put into developing these businesses and wanting to locate them here in Flint to create these tax revenues and jobs. Um, I, I will then make, a, uh, I guess, a prediction uh, that once these commercial establishments are up and running, <coughs> to deal with Ms. Field's comments, 
Once these commercial establishments are up and running, I will be willing to bet heavily that the state will eliminate the caregiver program, thereby uh, eliminating the uh, the issues that are associated, and I agree, it's a huge public safety concern, to have grows spotted all throughout the neighborhoods. That's not what we want. And this law, the, the Facilities Licensing Act, solves that problem. It takes it out of the gray area in the dark corners and the back alleys and puts it in, just as uh, the Deputy Chief said, into a legitimate uh, business format where these are respected business owners uh, who are complying with the law and doing everything that they can to run a professional and flawless business because even one, one slip up uh, would cost them uh, their millions of dollars in investment, as well as all of the jobs that they're going to create uh, and, and everything else associated with it, uh, put themselves at, at uh, risk of criminal penalties and, and what have you. But the state of Michigan has built in their own enforcement division and team. So while we certainly, uh, I think Mr. Mays brought up a great comment about uh, the ability to secure funding through this ordinance for whatever police resources we need locally, and I think that's a fantastic idea, and I know that all of my clients would absolutely support that and providing those funds for whatever oversight is necessary at the local level. But I will identify that the state of Michigan has an eight and a half million dollar assessment set aside in year one, specifically dished out among the lights people who obtain these licenses, specifically for the purpose of the Michigan State Police Enforcement Division of the Medical Marijuana Program. Similar to a casino, there are gaming agents that walk the floor. There's gaming agents in the casino cashier box, and, and, and all of those levels are, are have checks and balances and double checks and balances, especially when you're dealing with a program like this. Uh, it is very significant. Um, as it pertains to uh, some of the comments about, um, you know, crime in the area, and, and I mean, first of all, the, the children dying comment, I'm, I'm a little flabbergasted. No one in the history of the world has ever died from ingesting marijuana alone. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a bit of a misstatement there. But uh, the true facts show that underage use is down and all those issues. I mean, when, you, when you look into the real stats from Colorado, and I, I encourage all the council members to do their due diligence, um, it's very important to get the facts, as, as President Winfrey said. Know what you're talking about and get the real facts and make an educated decision. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of misinformation floating around there, and as Attorney Williams will tell you, most of our clients get all kinds of misinformation from all different sources, uh, Facebook posts or, or you know, wannabe uh, attorneys or wannabe specialists in these areas of law. There's a ton of misinformation out there, but our goal is to provide the, the correct information. And Madam, I, think, I, I think that, uh, yes sir. Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Leach, as it relates to this draft ordinance, is, is there any parts of it that we need to take a closer look at, change from what you see, or in your opinion, you and Attorney Williams, is it about ready to be adopted? Well, I think that it's uh, it's absolutely very close. I think that uh, Mr. Schrantz and Mr. Erickson have done a great job with this ordinance uh, over time. There's a lot of uh, developments that I see in this draft that were not included in previous drafts that are very important, such as uh, dealing with transferability of licenses or, or obtaining investors. You have to look at this business for what it really is. I mean, it's inevitable that people are going to have investors come in and want to invest in the expansion or, or uh, enhancement of these operations. Uh, or sell shares off or, or invest money. Uh, th th there's going to be a lot of movement. I mean, these, these businesses will be very valuable. And as long as they follow the process of going through the, 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 the reapplication process, again, to make sure that we have the, the, the right good actors that are obtaining these licenses and that they're then following all the rules and protocols is it critically important. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. I'm going to ask Mr. Erickson later about the appeal to the planning commission. Because I've been before the Planning Commission on a transition house. And I don't know if you was there, Mr. Jewell, but as the council person, I appealed to them not to put it next door to the neighbors who had called and complained to me, the council person. Fell on deaf ears. I'm concerned about an ordinance that I adopt and put in place. I might want to appeal to come to the council and or the zoning board of appeals and if it's appealed to the planning commission can it be further appealed to the zoning board because normally as a former zoning board of appeals member i think and you can correct me if i'm wrong i don't mind being corrected that's who gives variances so this is different you asking me to adopt a law that gives the planning commission some power 
that they don't have in normal circumstances, and I'm concerned with that because our planning commission seem to be a little more conservative than I. And they said, I ain't asking yet. And I went to them on something in my ward, a transition house, folks coming out of jail. And they act like I didn't mean nothing. Wouldn't postpone it. I'm tripping. So I'm concerned about it. So that's why I want to hear from Attorney Williams and or Mr. Leach because maybe I'm a moderate, maybe I'm a conservative, maybe I'm a liberal. Depend on what we're talking about. I want to know specifically, Mr. Leach, and you haven't really done it yet, if there's anything that you heard or seen in this presentation, any page, whether it's 500 feet, 1,000 feet, whether it's the field process, Attorney Williams provided us with a list in committee meeting. That's my main purpose. Is it something that we need to look at and discuss in this local ordinance that need to be changed, amended, or discussed? That's the pinpoint yes, specifics. And Ms. Williams, if you want to help out, I'm wanting to hear from y'all. I know y'all right talk because I talk with both of y'all. Yes, sir. Um, one of the main things that I would like to bring up is the ability of a an existing provisioning center uh, if they were a grandfathered location, um, the the city here is making amendments and expansions to the law and to what we're willing to allow. I think it's only fair that these businesses, even if they were a grandfathered location, have the ability to also transition from what was before a very restricted caregiver to patient model and be able to uh, conduct renovations or expand within that property or within the existing building that they're in. I think that's only fair. Uh, so the law has been an evolution. So let's deal with that one. Yes. Mr. Erickson, um, can you respond to that? Why, what is he saying? Grandfather, I heard talk of that. Explain the pros and cons of that. You and Kevin, just feel free. I wish y'all had a table and everybody could sit there. But, you know, and then we'll go to any other change or amendment. I, I do understand that there's a non-conforming use and conforming uses for properties, but given that this is a transition in law, I think that it's, it's only fair that it be recognized. Let's hear the response to that aspect, if you follow what he's saying. Yes, I do, Councilman. Um, the, the rationale here is, is we're, we're trying to balance two interests. We, we don't want to penalize uh, entities that have invested early in the city under the old ordinance. But at the same time, we want to be sure that the current ordinance has the teeth that are in it uh, going forward. And uh, so while it's not to punish these currently existing grandfathered locations to the extent that they're non legal non-conforming uses, meaning their, it, their current situation is inconsistent with the opt-in ordinance as proposed, that is where they would be a legal non-conforming use and be unable to expand. So specifically, those that are in the uh, D3 and D4 uh, zones that we have proposed are, too, are more residential and not necessarily appropriate to have the um, medical marijuana provisioning centers there. There are some under the prior ordinance that are in such zones. We are not penalizing them by requiring them to vacate the premises and not have a license, but we are balancing that interest with the interest of having those in the zones that we propose in the current ordinance going forward uh, by uh, characterizing it as a legal non-conforming use. Let me ask a question because I know even with my zoning board of appeals knowledge of conforming, non-conforming and all that, let me talk in plain language. Sure. You got about 13 provisional centers or so who's been granted a license. Yes. About 12 of them or so are operating. One's been granted a license and one is not operating even though it's been granted a license. Is that a fair statement, Kevin? So you got 13 license grants, 12 been operating, one been granted the license, and under our ordinance, they have a certain time to start operating, correct? And they haven't started operating yet. Which of them, 12 or 13, would be grandfathered in? Any of them? They would all be grandfathered. Okay, so all 13. Yes. So now, Mr. Leach, 
What is you saying? The ones that are grandfathered in, the ordinance prohibits them from what, expanding or expanding doing or something? Exactly, expanding or renovating or doing any changes to the inside. Okay, so let me ask this question. Attorney Reed Erickson, we could change an ordinance that could allow them to, we could adopt an ordinance that could allow those to expand, renovate, or whatever. Is we saying they can't do nothing? Yes, this, this body could um, change the parameters of the draft before you to, to make those legal uses as opposed to legal non-conforming uses. I don't want to... Uh, okay, hold up. Let me, let me keep okay. going. And then I'll listen to you. So, you know, if, if it's an important point you have to make, do me like I do you. I can handle it. Say, hold up, Maze. But what I want to find out is this. If we can adopt an ordinance that would allow them, because what I'm reading in state law, some of those could hook on or move to um, the industrial places, or they can't move. They would just have to be where they at as provision and center. Correct. Wouldn't I want an ordinance that allows them, if the numbers stay the same, to move? And because you say they can have certain things together at one site, if the license go with the person, why wouldn't I want them grandfathered in, or maybe I'm missing some to be able to move to the bigger site? Right. So we don't under the state law, we don't have the authority to grant growing licenses in anywhere but industrial zones. So these that are in any of the D zone districts are ineligible under the state law for I understand that. Okay. But I'm talking about the provision in center that's grandfathered in. You say if they grandfathered in they can't move, renovate, or change their building, but they you said in your presentation that the license go with the person. Yes. So that person can then move to the industrial site, correct? Now, now I'm following you, and know that that's that's incorrect only because the grandfather runs with the land that's under. The See what I'm saying? Yes. So, let's say they couldn't move the building; it runs with the land. It sit there. So what can we do by ordinance to allow that license that you say stick with the person to move? to what the state law allow it to do, be in that one facility. Have y'all talked about that? Is it any idea of Mr. Leach raising his hand? Uh, we had a perfect example here. Stick with us, um, we, we've got Brother, Brother Erickson. Here, you uh, might, we might end up Green. doing it your way, but I'm just talking as we, you know. We've got a perfect example here. Uh, Rochelle Arnott from the Green Bean um, occupies a portion of a larger building for their current uh, provisioning center under the old ordinance. Uh, they had a desire to expand and fill out the rest of the building because they're going to need that additional space. And I'm not saying that they would change buildings or move locations. It would be within the same building, but if you only occupied two rooms out of the ten in a building, what would be the harm in allowing them to then occupy the full building? And so our ordinance prohibits that? Uh, it does not, actually. So okay. page 20, letter Q. This ordinance. Correct. Page it's 20. 20. Letter Q. And I think it's important Go to... Go slow. Page I, I think 20. It's, it's Let me just, get there. Let me get there. I'm, I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to lay a general context on the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. So the special use that is granted to an individual per the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, which is a public act, that use is attached to that set of plans that's approved by the local body. That permit is attached to that individual. So that is state legislation through the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. A special use, which is what these are treated as. They're treated right. as special, special use, use I guess. as opposed to permitted use. Right. right. So page on page 20, and this is actually in direct, um, I, and I think it's worth noting too, what other cities are doing. You're talking about section P. Section Q. I think our pages are slightly off. Yeah. Okay, so Q. section Q, transfer of medical so marijuana. that would be page 21, yeah. section Q. Yep. Okay. Okay, so two, two parts here. First, I'm going to state what some other cities are doing, and second, I'll get into this. What other, some other cities are doing, and the city of Flint has chosen not to, so we don't create a hardship on patients and provisioning center ordinances, is we're not shutting them all down. Some cities, technically speaking, any provisioning center that operates without a state license is technically illegal. But that's the gray area, and that was the point of the legislation that was passed. 
So what we are attempting to do is honor those who are lawfully and legally operating, who have gone through the process, spent the money. I think you heard some of the testimony. So you're saying this state law prohibits them from coming back with new floor plans? It does not. So okay, what, but this says, what this says, if they want to retain partial ownership and they, let's say, they want to add a rider and they don't change the floor plans, all it requires is a public hearing. I know what this says, yeah. but that right, ain't my point. And it says they can change the floor plans. They have the ability to change the floor plans. They just have to go back through the site plan process. Before the planning commission. Which is, that is a stipulation in Chapter 50 of the City Municipal Code. Any expansion. And, and it was a fee involved. Yes, because you're going back through the site right. plan review process. So Mr. Leach is wrong that our ordinance don't allow them to expand, you're saying? It's per Q2 or Q3, it allows them to, if they're changing what was previously approved, they can come back. They still can operate under that current footprint, but they're requesting modifications to their floor plan. And per Chapter 50, any modification on any development, medical marijuana, GM, this building requires, triggers full site plan approval if you exceed 1,500 square feet. It's very small. So this is not just. So my question is, Mr. Leach must didn't know that was there. Either that or I'm not understanding his point. Okay, well, let's try to clear it up. Mr. Leach, did you know that was there in Q? I did read that, but what we've been previously told was that any grandfathered location that was, and again, I think there's a little disconnect in what grandfathering is, because now they're saying all 13 existing ones will be grandfathered. Before the original old ordinance, there was only, I think, eight that were grandfathered prior to the adoption of the MMA ordinance. Yeah, the one way back. Okay, and so we were told when we had previously tried to offer new floor plans and expand with those grandfathered locations that because it was a special land use, that it was not a permitted use, that there was no expansion or renovations that were possible. You had to go with whatever your first plans were. And all I'm asking, and I hope Kevin is correct with this, and that they can do that. And if that's the way, that that's the answer that we're getting tonight, then I'm fully satisfied that they should be able to expand and occupy the rest of the building. So Mr. Jewell, Mr. Rob Jewell, Planning Commissioner Jewell, you understood they could come back and modify the floor plan? Yeah, Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Jewell, can he respond? First of all, I'd like to state that this is exactly why, as chairperson, I did not want this to happen. We had our attorney and the zoning board and a planning commission here to speak on this. I'm going to say what I want because I'm chair. And this is not the appropriate time or place to have a back and forth or an inquisition on this issue. This was solely a meeting to discuss our ordinance and then have public comment at the end. None of the people here, Mr. Leach had not signed his name to be a public speaker. This is not, I will just reiterate that, I was outvoted. But Ms. Williams did. I was outvoted. But this is not what I intended this meeting to be as chair. Go ahead and speak now since we are on this process. Go ahead. Madam Chair, Madam Chair. Mr. Mays. You had a vision. You said that. We understand. Now the council done voted and it ain't about you, it's about the council. And we done went through an exercise. This is a presentation on a long awaited draft. And now I've got a commissioner here. And his name is Mr. Rob Jewell. We respectfully said, Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Jewell. Can I hear from him? Because they bring in the recommendation. The body is bringing it, the planning commission. I know what I'm doing. So I'm going to ask you respectfully again, can I hear what Mr. Jewell understood on the changing and modification of the floor plans as it relates to section Q. Now, if you want it to go the way you want, Mr. President, other council members, this is what I do. We can stop this. And we can come back and set another special meeting where we can get to the nitty gritty 
But I came here to really get to the nitty gritty on something we've been waiting for. I didn't know this would be a presentation. We'd hear from the public adjourn and go home. And it sounded like that's what Madam Chair wanted to do. She wanted to come, let us hear a presentation on a draft recommendation. Don't worry about whether we want to amend it, change it, learn something, and get details. Hear from two presenters and then public speaking for three minutes and go home. With respect, That's a Mr. waste Mace. of my time. You said don't interrupt you. May I? What do you want to say? For I, information. You ain't being fair. This is what we're discussing. It's right there. We've already had it. Well, I don't want us to beat it to death. It says what to do if you want to change the full plan. It says right there. That's page... Uh, Mr. Mr. Mays, I... That's what we I just wanted to, Mr. Griggs. I just wanted to address the fact that we will have another working session next Wednesday in committee meeting. This was a special meeting to okay. just be introduced, there will be two public okay. hearings still. If this ain't for me to learn nothing and to get to the nitty gritty, I'm going to ask to be excused, but I'm going to first hear what Mr. Erickson has to say. I've been meeting with people, including the staff, Mr. Erickson, been to planning commission meetings, and I still know that this is about the nitty gritty. And it's a waste of my time because I didn't have to be here. I already knew what was presented. I didn't have to draft ordinance for a week. The public comment, no disrespect to the public, the amount that's here, I'm going to see how many slips. How many slips do we have, um, Madam Clerk? If we, you may. we have eight slips. Eight slips. And I'll listen to the public, but three minutes, I'm going to see if she cuts y'all off in three minutes, and I'm going to recommend that you be fair because I'm a councilman. I wouldn't care if I needed a half an hour. Before I vote on something, I'm going to detail it, check it, use all information and resources, and what you say in your vision is ain't like mine. I apologize to those who took their time and have some knowledge and expertise as I do my due diligence. Is it something you want to say, Madam Chair, you want to direct my elected seat on what to ask and not to ask? Go I, right now. I do go. absolutely have something to say, Mr. Mays. We are hearing from the public. I do want to hear from them, as we all do. You could have but put there is a first fair process, the and there is an order on the agenda. Okay, my, Madam Chair, I would move to change the order of the agenda, and I would move that we stop and hear from the public. Second. Discussion. Okay, all those in Point of order, any discussion? I just said that. Any discussion? Oh, I didn't hear you. Yeah, I want to, if it's so important that we hear from the public for three minutes each, then if that's what got you messing up, in my opinion, my inquiry and getting this draft done and better and straight, then I've moved it. I hope it passed. We hear from the public, then get back down to business. You made the agenda, you and somebody, all put the public first because I'm here to take care of business and I respect the public. So, yeah, I'm going to vote to hear from the public because it's hindering what I'm trying to do. Any other discussion? We are now voting for an appeal, or no, for the change in the agenda in order to... We should be. Yeah, that's where we are now. No, point of he, order. He doesn't want point public speaking. We wasn't there. My motion is that we get there and come back to the question and answer. We was on question and answer. The question and answer was for Mr. Erickson and that's Mr. Schultz. That's your Schultz. opinion. I but that's my committee. A motion on the floor. If you want to continue to discuss it, the motion is to change the order of the agenda and hear from the public. I'll he, stop what I was Mr. Mays. So your change, because we are next into the public, and in order to have an orderly meeting, each member of the public that signed a slip was going to speak for three minutes. So what is your change to that? That we move it uh, where we stop doing question and answer, and we move public speaking up, because you keep talking about it. So that was my motion when I had the floor. I made it. It was probably second. That's where we had to read in the pause. Question and answer. Okay, so that's not a change to the agenda. 
That's what I said. I move that we change the order. But this is the order. Public speaking is next, Mr. Mays. We ain't out of question and answer yet, ma'am. Okay. Would you like to make a motion to be out of question and answer? No, we don't have to. There's a motion on the floor and been properly supported. I think the motion is to move on to public speaking for three minutes each person that signed a slip. Would you say that's correct, Madam Clerk? Well, I'm not sure. But I'm I mean, point, of, point of information, Madam Chair. Ms. Fields. I believe Mr. Mays' intent is to be able to have additional question and answer. So in order to be fair to the public, he wants to change the order of business so we can have public speaking and then we can return to question and answer. Is that correct, Mr. Mays? Clearly, I thank those of us who are here. I want it clearly understood. We were in question and answer. She keeps saying something about the public. I respect the public. I made a motion to stop what we were doing, hear from the public, and I'm assuming that after we hear from the public, we'll resume back with the business. Any discussion? Mr. Griggs, do you still want to discuss? I don't want to stay here to the... I don't want to stay here till the cows go home, okay? I have three explicit questions to Mr. Erickson. I'd like to get those done because I, I want to hear the public, yes, but will I still get to ask Mr. Erickson my three questions that will take approximately one minute each? With this motion on the floor after public speaking. Yeah, Miss, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Griggs. Through you to Mr. Griggs. Mr. Griggs, I don't want to stay here till the cows come home, I can assure you, but I'm here to tell you this ordinance and what Flint is fitting to get into. You got people want to invest six million, 50 million. This is major and it's being looked at all around the state. Council people then got voted in. This is one of the biggest ordinances maybe that we'll deal with. This ain't as big as the 30 year water crisis deal. I didn't want to sit in closed door mediation and go to Detroit, the federal court, but it comes with the territory. I can assure you, if we hear from the public, what she kept saying, I will yield. You can ask questions more than two or three. You deserve to ask more than two or three. You deserve that. I'll yield. I wouldn't care if I asked, listen to how I'm going to say this on purpose. Now, other question, and we can meet again. But when we meet again, I'm going to still hear from Attorney Erickson. If there's some planning commissioners here, I'm going to hear from Kevin Stroud. I'm going to hear from Brenda Williams and Attorney Brenda, Brenda Williams and Attorney Leach. I'm going to hear from them provisional center people. But I can only do that as five of us sit here. If y'all sit and leave, no quorum. I won't vote, but when it come time to vote on this important ordinance, I'm going to say not enough information, so forth and so on. So I hope that pacifies or answers what you do. If you listen to the public, with like what I'm going to do, once that's over, I yield. If this motion fail and I have to flow, I'll yield. I ain't in no hurry. And I don't want to monopolize the flow. I want y'all to do what y'all want to, but Councilman Mays ain't going to vote till he finishes due diligence. I don't think we're supposed to vote today, are we? No, Mr. no, but we gather an Excuse me, Mr. Mays and Mr. Griggs. You had the floor. You interrupted, Mr. Griggs. Are you done with discussion, Mr. Mays? Look, when I say through you to Mr. Griggs, I don't mind talking with my colleague, but I hear you. I hope you'd be that strict on Kate Fields and them. Thank you. Ms. Fields. I'd just like to say that um, I would support this motion if uh, Councilman Mays would agree to have Mr. Griggs or any other councilman ask their questions prior to him resuming his questions, because I think he has far more questions than a lot of the council people, but I do believe that everybody should have the opportunity because this is a special meeting for this particular purpose 
and I think Mr. Mays does have a right to ask his questions. Madam Chair, I have no problem following that suggestion. I wouldn't care if it's Mr. Griggs, you, Ms. Winfrey Carter, President Winfrey, and Mr. Davis, and Ms. Fields. I have no problem being last. I'm just saying when it closed out, I got questions. So if you're going to support it, we'll hear from the public. Mr. Griggs, look like you're going to be up next. I'll wait to last. You know, if I wanted to be sarcastic, I'd say they always say the best to last. I ain't got no problem with that. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor of what are we doing now? Changing the order of business to allow for public speaking first. Thank you. All in favor, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Any nays? Okay, so motion passed. We are now in public speaking. Who is our first speaker, Madam Clerk? We have the following speakers. I'll give the names in just a few moments. But the public speaking itself should be addressed specifically to the medical marijuana facilities proposed ordinance only. And the first speaker is Mr. R.L. Mitchell. This is the February 28th special City of Flint City Council meeting. Good evening, Council. Hello. I'm uh, uh, Mr. R.L. Mitchell. Concerned citizen. Uh, to you, Madam President, and to Ms. Fields. And you, and about this, uh, Kevin's, this guy, I remember signing up for the petitions and him and his two laboratory techs for all that, but now, thanks to the cap, I mean, Lieutenant Captain, talking that stuff like he don't give a concern about Flint citizen, he gonna turn us over to the county across the street, he just throw the baby out with the bath water, along with the, the water situation, the same thing. Because if I'm not mistaken, the last night, you and Miss talking about the economic stuff. And I had a sister went to run into with all uh, this Laura thing. But when I found out, I found out Laura's not a person anyway in the computer. This Laura, he turned it over to the whole Laura situation. And uh, what I'm saying, yesterday I had a conflict with Miss Laura and Farmer's Market. I used to go there every Tuesday and get me a hot dog and a regular pop and some potato chips, uh, Madam Council, from a other Davidson mayor. But before I come in there, it was four, it's a table with four seats in it. Three people called me out in time I grabbed for the seat. Miss Laura hopped up and snatched the seat, said, you, Mr. you Mitchell. get out of here. And, and then uh, this godfather, grandfather stuff, a big dark guy said, uh, and I said, who are you? He said, no, somebody you, you don't want to know. And I said, okay, because that was humility, like I was humiliated. I had $35 was a bottle and they got robbed, took from my backyard yesterday. I figured that that was that Miss Laura grandfather followed me into my house and took my bottles out of, the, out of my backyard. And that's why talking about protect this, these lawyers, with the marijuana stuff, with it, with, with, and then, and that's, and uh, you do any means possible to jump on a citizen now and want to smoke marijuana and all that stuff, and you act like you don't want the public to have an input. Now give me some feedback, you and Miss Fields, because Kellogg's cornflake is a black woman, and oh, and 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 you and 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 I mean, there are all these drunken lawyers don't want to speak stuff in the old general motor property. Thank you, is. And all this, they got the clerk up there scratching their head like she don't know. I ain't never heard her talk like that before. And all that, and all you crook. And look at that president over there sweating bullets with his, with his reading up there, look like a mason. Call my way to jump. Thank you, is. Our next speaker is Mr. Todd Metzger. Mr. Metzger. Here 
Uh, I'd like to speak in regards to my particular project and uh, how this is going to affect it. Uh, I currently own the five-story Stevens Moving and Storage Building over near Buick City. Uh, it is currently zoned D6. I've been trying for the last couple of years to work through the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, it's been an uphill battle, uh, and this ordinance doesn't do anything to alleviate the problems that I've been having with that particular one. It actually has added a few issues, uh, in particular the setbacks. Um, I believe that uh, because marijuana is a Schedule One, first and foremost, that uh, it has to be within uh, kept, kept uh, outside of a thousand foot, regardless of what type of license that you're using, uh, according to state law. I do believe. Uh, I also believe that the other setback should be reduced to 500, and then uh, that'll alleviate a lot of the issues with variances that will come up. I'll be the first in line to get a variance. Uh, if this particular uh, proposal is approved. Uh, my, my particular issue is that I'm a thousand foot from the VFW park, but in order to get there, you have to swim across the Flint River to enter the park within a thousand feet. And so it's kind of in the, as the flow cries, uh, as the crow flies um, determination, uh, it kind of puts me at a bit of a disadvantage. And again, with the 300 foot from residences, I have unanimous uh, support from everyone within 300 feet. As a matter of fact, I currently employ uh, three of those people to help me clean that area. I not only own that building, but I own nine residential properties within a thousand feet myself. I've also purchased two residential properties and gifted those to people in the neighborhood that have been helping me clean up that area. Uh, in addition, there's other issues that have come up with this new version in, as far as co-locations uh, being 30,000 feet. Uh, I believe that's way too uh, excessive. Uh, that is not necessary, especially for a processing and a retail location. And, and it also in regards to the industrial um, zoning for growing and processing and the others, uh, according to House Bill 4209, page 49, section 501, uh, industrial is only for growing. There is no such thing in Section 502 in regards to processing. Uh, there also is no need, to, I see that you have uh, secure transporters, you also have testing facilities, all in industrial zoning. Growing is the only one that requires industrial zoning. The other licenses, there's no mention in the House Bill 4209 of those being required in those industrial areas. Uh, and as well, in my last remaining few seconds, in, re in regards to the excise fund and the revenue sharing that comes from this, 25% uh, is going to go to the City of Flint Municipality, 30% is going to go to the, uh, the County Municipality, there's 5% that's going to be going to the County Sheriff, there's 5% that's going to the State Police, and another 5% for training. So there's an adequate amount of funds that can be dis dis distributed uh, that are uh, located in House Bill 4209, page sex uh, section 602. So I don't believe that that's going to be an issue as far as revenue goes. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Ronald DeCicio. Um, thank you. For those of you that don't know me, I am the founder of the Microphone, please. Yeah, to the mic, sir. Make sure you want to start off. Mitchell. I am speaking to the mic. Give me that. There you go. Your, your box. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Let me start over real quick. Uh, my name is Rhonda Seco. I'm the founder managing member of Hurley's Home Care and Hospice. I was before you about three years ago requesting two uh, provisioning center licenses. I explained in great detail as well as was requested to provide a full business plan, which I did. Uh, submitted the application, was approved. I have had a tremendous amount of difficulty working with the uh, billing department. I've submitted prints six times. Uh, only to be returned every three or six months with some minor changes. I would encourage the business of this city is to bring business in. You need to be more business friendly. The city, the, the building department should not be able to review your business plan, and, or I'm sorry, your, your prints, make some nominal change, and then wait three or six months to get it back. But what I'm really requesting here is the fact that I feel that my grandfather, two licenses should still be honored. Uh, I purchased two buildings specifically at the request of the city council. I've rehabbed those to the extent allowable through the building department, putting in new roofs. My taxable value on one building, that was uh, the Genesee Land Bank, I bought it for $18,000, was paying 1000 in taxes. 
The city of Flint reassessed it at $280,000. I'm now paying $14,000 in taxes. My second building I bought for $27,000. That's been reassessed at $85,000. So when Ms. Galloway comments about lack of funds, I'm paying, I paid an additional $60,000 in taxes, gotten absolutely nothing for it, and I'm not requesting it. I would just like my licenses to be approved. A couple other things I think you need to know about the industry in general. There are things called closed door pharmacies. Most of you have never heard of them. You don't know what they are because they're closed doors. Most of the business of marijuana can be a closed door pharmacy. There's no reason, other than a provisioning center, you could have a processing center wherever you wanted and issue as many licenses as you wanted. That's all big revenue for the city, and that's what they need. You're talking about rehabbing properties. I know that the city of Pinconi opened up licenses. Within the first 15 minutes, in city licensing fees alone, they got $175,000. The city next door to it, Bangor, and I might have those two flipped, issued a 39-plant stacked grow license, 1,500 plants, which is about 600,000 plants to one single grower. That alone brought $200,000 in annual fees just to that city. So when you talk about money for law enforcement, I don't think you fully appreciate the width and depth of revenue and how this can really revitalize the city. So when I hear about these setbacks and limits, I would strongly encourage you to reconsider all of them. If you wanna put setbacks and limits on provisioning centers, that's perfectly understandable. But the rest of the licenses, I'm a very libertarian guy, let the free market dictate what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Madam Clerk. Next speaker is uh, Mr. Reggie Davidson. Council, uh, Reggie Davidson, Legal Research One. Now, there was some talk earlier about the lack of accountants and banks being able to do business with medical marijuana. And I just suggest that uh, folks do their research because there has been uh, bills passed by the state uh, that will cover accountants and, and state charter banks and allowing them to do business with medical marijuana. It just seems to me there should be a little bit more research there. Now, I'm not an attorney. I work with an attorneys, and I have a few clients that would like to bring a new build into the city of Flint. They're, they are been attempting to buy a piece of land for over 10 months, and it's just amazing to me that we can't even get an RFP issued over a 10-month period of time for a company that's willing to spend $4 million in new brick and steel. Whether, whether they get the license passed or not, they're willing to take that risk. And we can't even get an RFP issued on a piece of property that's been vacant for years, undeveloped. That's just amazing to me. And I've talked to everybody from city council to planning to legal, and it's just something just spinning in circles. And it's just amazing to me as a resident of the city of Flint who pay taxes here, who know the condition of the city, and people who are trying to get things done. Now listen, don't get me wrong, I really can appreciate the overworked and understaffed that Mr. Kevin Strong and his office is going through. They're doing, to me, an amazing job. The council members that I talk to uh, that be on the front line, like Eric Mays and the uh, new city council president, and uh, uh, Mr. Santino, because it's in their ward, have, have been very receptive to me. And so all I'm simply saying is, you have companies and people willing to invest in Flint, but can't even get across the line on simple things like new brick and steel. I have no understanding. I've been waiting on an RFP to be issued for the last two months that I've been told is going to be issued, and there's nothing being issued. That's just a travesty to me. And I don't say that to undermine anybody's ability to get anything done, but the fact of the matter is nothing is being done. And it's ridiculous. It's borderline ridiculous because this company has since opened up in three other municipalities in the state of Michigan and have bought eight acres in Orin, and they're building and they're making things happen for other communities other than Flint. And so I'm just simply saying people will bypass us if we don't make some decisions here. A lot of this is internal bickering and gridlock, and as a taxpaying citizen of Flint, I just don't like to see it on no level. Due order is due order, and, and it seems to me you should be able to make some decisions. Planning has done a lot of work. I, I mean, I've been interacting with Kevin's staff 
to the degree that I have, and they have really done a lot of work. And you guys should really support the work that they've done on this ordinance, and my suggestion is pass it. They've done a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Madam Clerk. Next speaker Clark. is Attorney Brenda Williams. Attorney Williams. First of all, do I get additional time? Given that Mr. Leach was up here, so I would ask one of the council people to move that I get additional time to be procedurally correct. Madam Chair. Mr. Mays. If we going back to the question and answer, you will get that time. Um, if the majority agree, I think we already settled that issue. This would be additional three minutes to that time. And then I get some more time? You will, if I think we've agreed to go back to question and answer. First of all, it would be the pleasure of the council to do it now. It would be unorthodox. I would leave oh. it alone and wait till after the public speak. Okay, thank you, Councilman Mays. Um, on behalf, uh, oh, and yes, I do have some clients. But first of all, as an attorney and as a student of government, I do believe in public policy. And rather I represent people Public policy is something that I have always looked at in making decisions in the criminal field as well as in this field. So, yes, but there is no bias. When I, when I speak, I speak for what I believe rather than being biased. But, of course, this is my job, as is your job, Mr. Erickson, for the City of Flint Attorney's Office. This, I have reviewed the draft, but not in detail, as you know, it has just been released to the public as we walked in this building today. But in looking at it, I would like this body to look at the fact that medical marijuana, the provisioning centers, the grow, the safety uh, uh, facility, these are new business entities of ventures that we should be looking at as a business and not as a drug activity. Now I think that part of the problem in making decisions in, in the body here is that we have some who looks at it like drugs. Well, do you look at Oxycontin? That's a drug. And you go to a drug store to get it. Medical marijuana should be looked at as an alternative medicine that can be sold in various, in a place that has been designated by the state, just like you go to Rite Aid, or you go to Walgreens, or you go to CVS, or wherever you go to get your medicine. And looking at this draft, I am somewhat concerned of the biases that I see. You have, they are asking you to approve 20 provision centers with 13 already being grandfathered in, so they're really asking you to approve for seven. I think that is a bias. And if we want to get fair and you want to be fair, this is the time that Flint can finally start with something new and be fair as it has not definitely been fair in a lot of our other matters in this community, then we say none of them get grandfathered in. And we just go with 20 and we make sure that then they all have fair shake. Or we can have 20 in addition to the 13. Because at the end of the day, all of these provision centers either are not going to be, some of them are not going to be approved by the state. Some of them are going to die by the state. Now I only have five seconds. So I will continue this, Mr. Mays, when you say I have my time as look, Mr. Leach had. I look forward. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Our next speaker is Mr. Paul Herring. Mr. Herring. Good evening, Council. I didn't think I was going to be speaking tonight, but my phone has been blowing up. Uh, people that are watching this program are asking me to ask questions. And the first question they're asking me is uh, the police department, background checks. Why do we have a chief doing background checks and not the personnel department? 
either in the city or the police department or hiring a special person, training and vetting them to do this special job. The other question, and it kind of hinges on what Brenda said, is when are we going to do the same thing to Rite Aid and Walgreens? When are we going to make it so Walgreens can't put up a store 500 feet away from a church? When are we going to make it so Rite Aid can't be by a liquor store or by a park? Why are churches even in the equation as far as boundaries are concerned? I remember a gentleman coming to the council uh, trying to do a needle exchange. And he showed us a map of all the places that qualified with these 500 feet requirements. And it was Pearson Road under the viaduct of 475. We're limiting ourselves with those kind of restrictions. This could be a boondoggle for the city of Flint. And we're going to mess it up. Why only 20? If the citizens we can handle 100, do 100. It's a business. And only so many businesses can be supported by the customer base here in Flint. Don't limit it. Take advantage of it. The other question is, when are the people that have been arrested for marijuana crimes going to be released from jail? Are their records going to be expunged because this is now legal? And what are we going to do with the time that the police get back from not having to put those people in jail anymore? They're not chasing the nickel bags and dime bags anymore. The big question is, how is the police department in the city of Flint going to recover the revenue lost by not putting these people in jail, by not sending them through the court system? by not hanging them up uh, in this uh, industrial complex. I'm going to put my glasses on for the last one because my handwriting is atrocious. And that's it. In all things purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, y'all, but we got to be one like the hand in all things beneficial to our mutual progress. Thank you. Madam Clerk, our last speaker is Mr. Arthur Woodson. Mr. Woodson. <laughs> how you doing? Hey, uh, I used to smoke weed. I call it weed, not marijuana. I used to smoke weed back in high school. And I could smoke about an ounce a day. After I quit, it makes me paranoid, but that's just me. But I still don't have a problem with people smoking marijuana. But they told me that I needed indica. I mean, I couldn't smoke indica. I had to smoke chief or something. So there it is. See, veterans have, which I have, PTSD. They are doing studies in Arizona. They saying that P this marijuana helps our PTSD. Do you know how many veterans have PTSD that can benefit from this? What I hate the most is that Flint is always behind on everything. We always talk about bringing back manufacturing jobs. It's not just about manufacturing. That's why Flint is in the situation it's in now, because we, per we focus on one thing. We're not talking about technology. Technology, uh, Sydney Valley out in California, booming. Colorado, booming right now with marijuana. They got so much money, they don't even know what to do with it. Why is it that we always the last one? And then we allow some pastors, not all pastors, some pastors, to get in the way of our progress. Remember one thing, when no, any city in Michigan with a casino, they did not have a casino. Flint tried to get a casino down here at Outer World. We would have been the first one. Now all those Christians that fought against it, they're catching buses to get $20 to soaring eagles and Motor, uh, Motor City and MGM. We could have had that money here. They said we're going to be the highest crime rate ridden city. Guess what? We didn't have a casino, but we did make the highest crime rate without, without the casino. Let's stop getting in the way of making city, uh, Flint City better than what it is because of certain Christians who go home after church. They only a Christian on Sunday, but Monday and Saturday they smoking blunts. And I see them at the corner store. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm serious. They only Christians on Sunday. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them, they get in the way of progress. <laughs> and then guess what? God told us that we can use everything that's grown. I mean, it's not altered. It's naturally grown. 
He told us to, you know, live off the land. And I mean, you know, hey, let's live off of it. I mean, you know, and use the green that we get back and pay. So we want, so we have to stop using the, the water and sewer fund for revenue because this will generate a lot of revenue and we won't have to rob Paul to pay Peter. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Ms. Fields. Mr. Griggs. Ms. Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Griggs. Madam Chair, point of information. Mr. Mays. That gentleman had a slip. I know what the rules say, but that's my point of information. What do you want to do with it? Go ahead. You can speak. I'll only take one minute. My name is Benjamin Horner. Um, I am uh, owner-operator of Michigan Organic Solutions on Door Highway, the first medical marijuana dispensary opened up in 2010. Um, I do have some concerns. I want to thank Kevin and Corey and, and uh, Mr. Reed for all the hard work that they've done in passing this. But I do understand that if uh, we are to remodel our location, uh, that uh, we would have to submit a new site plan review and that we would lose our grandfather's status of our property. So I would hope that we would look at that issue. Uh, also, I would ask that the city council consider moving commercial medical marijuana processing centers from group F to group E. The state does not require that processing centers uh, be in uh, industrial zoning. You know, basically this is like making the topicals and the edible products not shaped like gummy bears because the state's saying that we can't do that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there's lots of restaurants and, and commercial facilities that are not being used in the city of Flint where a small business owner could operate these. If we put them all in industrial zones, it really is limiting small business owners and local small business owners from being able to uh, be able to do these processing centers. And then finally, when it comes to the caregivers, I, I would recommend that the, the city, after they do this, you know, consider doing a separate ordinance for uh, residential. Uh, Tabeek does put in some restrictions on, on your ability to say that you can't cultivate uh, a, a, in a residential community, but you can put some guidelines, possibly like limiting the amount of square foot or can't can't canopy. But what I understand from the uh, state government is now they are telling all caregivers that as soon as this system goes into place, that they're going to have 30 days to turn over any medication that they have into the licensed dispensary so that they can, you know, have a legal, safe way to uh, not put that medicine out of the streets where it would be going into the hands of people that don't have cards or maybe our children or things of that nature. The state is, is going to put a tax on these caregivers, uh, they, and although you know economics aside, there's always going to be a black market to a certain extent. You know, I think that w with with the licensed facilities that are being properly regulated, um, and and as they transition into recreational use over the next couple of years, this this tax and regulated system will keep uh, marijuana out of the hands of young people that really shouldn't have it. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Griggs. Mr. Griggs, didn't, yes. Okay, we're good, Mr. Erickson, go. There you Where is it? This is the February 28th, 2018, okay. City of Flint. Is this a city, city or a county ordinance? So this is the uh, city ordinance. Okay, that puts me back to a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, why does the county get any of these taxes? So that question would be best answered by the state legislature. And I say that only because we did not set that division. That was set by the uh, MMFLA uh, and the state legislature. How come they're not paying 6% instead of 3% taxes? I. Uh, uh, it may not be satisfying, but that would be my same answer, that that tax specifically was set by the state. That was set by the state. Correct. Okay. Uh, oh, my, my next one is, uh, under state licensing process, be a Michigan resident for two years. Do you mean at least two years or a, continu a continuous resident? 
I'm, I'm worried about, say, some big company comes in here and claims a residence for two years, starts a company, and then that person or whatever moves away and then the money goes to a different state. So that requirement is, is also set by the state. So that's that's in our yeah. overview. That's not a requirement for our ordinance, but that is the state. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fields? Uh, yes, I would just like to make a referral uh, to the city attorney's office to ask them to see what you could do in terms of creating a separate ordinance to talk about the primary caregiver and the nuisances in the neighborhood. Is there anything you can recommend that we could do by ordinance to help regulate that more or, or prevent misuse of it in reg residential neighborhoods? And the other um, referral I'd like to, um, actually it's not a referral, but I would ask like to ask Planning and Development and Kevin Schrantz, you, I would like to ask you at what point in time are you going to dedicate the same type of energy that you put into this marijuana ordinance to creating uh, renewable energy uh, zoning and planning and building ordinances? I think it's way, way overdue. Sure. Well, I can tell you that um, when this goes through, we're probably not going to have much time to do anything because administratively with our staff, um, we struggle with the intake we have now, be it medical marijuana or be it a billion dollar GM plant or a hundred million dollar Lear plant. I mean, we're seeing, we've never seen this much business outside, completely outside of, both of medical marijuana plans come through our office and in any plan, regardless of the use goes through it, it you know, a thorough review. So if, if you submit a plan that lacks and has quite a few omissions, you're going to get it back and told to fix it. Any community deals with that. Um, so we would like to do that, but ultimately, you know, we were asked by council to, to work on this, um, and we can we we only have enough hours in the day and enough staff who don't drive them. You know, like every every division is, like you heard Captain Fernritter said, and not only police, but I think you have to remember, planning is the first line that intakes these. And I could easily see, and, uh, and this applicants are probably not going to like this, but um, it's probably going to slow down because, again, we're not supposed to work more than 40 hours a week. We already, our staff works up, up over its 50, sometimes 60, dealing with what we have now. So uh, we'd like to work on a lot of other stuff, but until we, you know. Well, that's have good other, to know, you know? And, and I don't know because we're not in the process yet, but I would suggest the department perhaps asking for a position. Um, to handle because there's obviously revenue that's going to be attached to this for an additional person to handle not only that but some other planning, zoning, building things that need to be accomplished. Yeah, and I think that's... You could but ask. Yeah, and I think once we set the fee schedule, which will come before this body, once we understand where we're going with this, the other thing to point out too is 25% of that doesn't go to the city. 25% of that fund, that sales tax fund, is split up amongst all municipalities. So the city of Flint does not receive 25% of that. So I think that's very important. There's a big difference in money there. And until we know, um, in every community, MML, you know, we've leaned on the MML. They won't. They are not even comfortable giving out solid estimates. Um, and I trust them. Um, thank you for bringing up, yeah, that distinction. I had forgotten that, that that is the way that was initially uh, described but I also want to point out to all those people who are out there who support this because it's um, you know it, uh, it's an opportunity for economic development for business enterprises etc you know there e even though a lot of the Obama initiatives are gone now you know you never know what can come back again and I think that marijuana isn't the only business that could actually be um, fruitful and bring prosperity to the city. So it'd be nice if we concentrate on, especially those of you entrepreneurs out there that have the funding to do this, you know, think about putting aside some of that money and, uh, I don't know, build solar panels in Flint. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mays? Madam Chair. Oh. 
I thought I had a mom. I had Mays on my list before Davis. Was I wrong? Madam Chair. Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Griggs. I forgot to ask a question to Mr. Erickson. So whenever you can fit me in. Okay. Um, can we circle around again, Mr. Griggs? Yep. Who wants to go? Because I don't know if I had it wrong. Mr. Davis? Thank you, Madam Chair. At this time, I'd like to say, being non-biased, I never endorsed in marijuana, but a lot of people I know have. And um, I just hope this body get to in the place of doing business in a more timely fashion. I would love to see us move to be one of the first municipalities actually to write these ordinances to be on the front edge of this. This is an opportunity for us to have new revenue in this city. And um, we gotta get to the place with removing, like the young man stated earlier, a lot of this red tape. We should be a hindrance of new business and new vision. This is the 21st century, this is 2018. So marijuana is on the forefront of the whole nation right now. And there's nothing actually really, uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but it's very pertinent that this body, I'm hoping this body, be the first to enact ordinances to move this city forward because we can use the revenue in such as economic development and everything else, but we need to move in a timely fashion. We already have a lot of postponed issues and ordinances. We need to get to the place that we move this thing along expediently because I really think it would help this community. Did you have a question, Mr. Mays? I mean, Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis? That was just a statement. You didn't have a question? Well, yeah, that was my question and statement because I want the young man to leave without me saying it because we are a sluggish body that need to get in gear. And that would be my question, answer, and everything else. Okay, Mr. Mays, did you have anything? Oh, Mr. Griggs, I think he's yielding to you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Erickson, I forgot to ask. Oh, my gosh. Oh, since this is a city ordinance, is there a way we could, uh, you know, the only thing that worries me about this whole thing is all the cash, the cash dealing. Is there a way that we could say these provisioning centers can use some of our local banks and put the cash in there? So, um, Councilman, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. The state actually did amend the MMFLA recently to clarify that the state will not hold it against banks, accountants, and professionals for engaging in business with these licensees. Um, I, I can't say whether that will fully um, appease everyone because there is the issue of, of federal law and, and banking. Um, but the, the state has taken that action already to, within its authority, um, kind of state its intention that this is non-criminal activity. So um, I think it would be redundant to the city to do so. I think to the extent possible uh, at the levels below federal um, that that action has occurred to, to help um, alleviate the concerns to the extent possible. Before you go, and then we can go to Mr. Mays, um, if that's all right. Uh, I heard the question that it, or the statement that it, and I may have missed this and all this, it's been a while, <laughs> a lot of talking, uh, that it was illegal federally. I thought that's not the case. Is it illegal? Yes. So uh, the, the current status of, of Marijuana, medical or otherwise, is a Schedule One federal illegal drug. That's that's true. Um, the the reality is we we're in a bit of a um, a conflicting state where uh, you have Michigan and a number of I think it's 23 or so states that have allowed for medical marijuana that are legalized at the state level. Colorado has a very similar process that, to what this the what Michigan is uh, has adopted now. Um, and you have states like Colorado and California that have allowed for recreational marijuana where you can just buy marijuana if you're 21. Um, all of that is technically in conflict with federal law. Um, so there is an open question if the federal government 
would eventually take any kind of legal action against these entities, and technically, right now, they can. I can't speak to the future as to whether Congress will change that Schedule I uh, status of medical marijuana. Uh, I would think that, A, federal resources are limited when it comes to federal enforcement, and I don't think it's particularly likely in the immediate future that this would occur, especially given that there are recreational states in existence. If I had to guess, and it would strictly be a guess, any federal action that would be taken to kind of send a message by the current administration, I would venture would be against a recreational state first uh, before we would have any issues at the, at the state of Michigan level. Again, that's not to say that it can't happen, and in fact, one of the uh, provisions in our ordinance, much like the state of Michigan is doing, is an acknowledgement of federal law. Uh, because anyone who gets one of these licenses, we don't want them to come back and say, well, you enticed me to do it. I didn't know it was illegal. Obviously, uh, it, it is illegal under federal law, um, so we are in a bit of a limbo um, as, as this political movement, if you will, moves forward. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Erickson? a response to a couple of the people that are fighting, trying to buy property and stuff. I know the slowness of this city. Uh, I started a new business that didn't exist here and it's becoming quite successful about four years ago. I went to the planning commission and told them I wanted to do this uh, bed and breakfast here. I said, and the chairman of it says, who would want that in their neighborhood? But now my neighborhood is going nuts thanking me starting this business and we're going to have to expand we pay 11 percent taxes i have a lot of com uh, compassion for you people trying to get something out of this city it really drags as a matter of fact the zoning's not even been approved for my business yet that's been four years so that's it i don't that's not to you eric that's to the people that are having trouble trying to make the machine move. That's all. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mays, did you want to know? Because I think we're done with Mr. Mays. I'm yielding to you. I said I'll wait to everybody if you got questions. I'm good. Okay. What I want to do, I want to circle back to the floor plan question through you to Mr. Rob Jew. And then I want to hear from Brenda Williams, Attorney Williams. Yeah. So through you, Madam Chair, to Mr. Jewell. Mr. Uh, Jewell. Madam Chair, I understand this is your committee meeting. You need to turn on your microphone. Is it on now? Yes, thank you. Madam Chair, uh, this is your legislative committee meeting. Uh, you're here to, according to the document released, is to the purpose of a briefing regarding medical marijuana facilities proposed ordinance, which was presented, as well as getting input from the public, as well as questions and concerns raised by each of the members. As you know, I am a member of the Planning Commission. However, I cannot speak on behalf of the Planning Commission. I have not been authorized to speak on behalf of the Planning Commission. I am only one. And as Mr. Mays knows, he can speak as a council person for himself, but he cannot speak for the council as a whole. Madam Chair. So, Mr. Mays. Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Jewell, are you telling me it is your understanding that as a planning commissioner, appointed by the council, you can't answer a question as it relates to a floor plan and an ordinance that y'all worked on? And if not, then I would say, okay, go ahead and sit down. But then I would put it formally to call you and others, even if we have to subpoena you. I'm going to yeah. get to the answer. 
I'm simply asking you, as a plan and commissioner, what is your understanding about the floor plan aspect of some y'all recommending to us? And if you uncomfortable doing it as a commissioner, then I'll move on to Miss Williams. But don't put me in the category with you because if I go to any meeting and they ask me something, I don't speak for the council, but I surely speak as a first ward councilman. Mr. Jewell, it is your prerogative and your um, what you would like to do or speak. Madam Chair, uh, the council person is collecting, inf in my view, collecting information to make certain points and concerns. I also have a concern of how my information will be utilized or interpreted. And this document that you receive, as presented by both the city attorney and the lead planner was reviewed last night as well over the previous months in regards to establishing and drafting this and the planning commission supported the review for approval and passed this on to you so the planning commission is in support of the information that is in this document so I'm at a loss as the council person Mays, any particular concerns. Madam Chair, Mr. through you to Mr. Jewell, was that a unanimous vote? Can you divulge that, do you know? It was a public meeting, and, it, and if I remember correctly, it was unanimously supported. And so that means you supported it. And as a planning commissioner, you should know about floor plans more so than me or anybody up here. That's what you've been appointed to do. We know we can talk to staff. But let me ask you this question, if you can answer this, Mr. Jewell. When does your term expire? <laughs> or have it already expired? My term has expired as of March of last year. And do you know and that as, the new... Let and me as... Let me... And as Mr. state Mays, law finish. states... As you're well aware, Mr. Mays. No, I don't say what I'm well aware of. Let me ask this that, question. Madam Chair. Mr. Mays, this really isn't an inquisition. Sure, I, uh, sure, I, I'm, I have I'm no problems, Madam Chair. Let him continue. State law, to my understanding, allows publicly appointed individuals, appointed by public bodies or by an, an, an entity approved by such, to continue to serve in that capacity until either reappointed or replaced. And so as such, I have continued in my role as that publicly appointed official to continue my civic duty and responsibility to continue that to whether I am reappointed or replaced. Ms. Madam Chair, I have no more questions from Mr. Jewell at this time, but I thank you, Mr. Jewell, so much. But I like for people to state state law, but I asked a simple question about planning law. And that's what I wanted an answer to. I didn't get it. He sidestepped it. And I'm going to say like I talk. I'm not studying that. Let me say this, Mr. Um, Kevin Trout. I want to make a referral. Give me a list of every planning commission member whose term had expired. I know what the new charter said. The new charter allows people to carry on, but it's some specific language in the new charter that took effect January 1st that I'm going to recommend that staff look at. I want that referral made to the city attorney and to Kevin Stroud them as it relates to planning commission. Now, I know that we got some language in the back of the charter. We discussed it in council meeting. Um, and that's why we discussed through you, Ms. Br to, to Ms. Brown, why we know she's going to continue, I think, to serve for these next five years, if she chooses. And we referred that language to the city attorney in last council meeting. And I just ain't satisfied with what I heard here just now and this reason. I've been around for years. So I want to make a referral. Um, that the city attorney's office, as well as if you want to look at it too, Mr. Stroud, 
review the language in the newly adopted charter as it relates to that issue. I'm going to move on because I ain't never experienced such a thing in my life. Madam Chair, can I hear from Ms. Williams at this time? Yes, before Ms. Williams, you can come up, but I just want to point out that it was really a question and answer, once again, for Mr. Schrantz and Mr. Erickson, not for any member in the audience. Madam Chair, I think we voted on some of this for Ms. Williams, and as far as a question and answer... I'm not referring to Ms. Williams. I'm referring to even a planning commission. And so I don't know that these people are going to come up here in their official capacity and can't answer a question about a flow plan on a recommendation from them. I didn't know that it was wrong. Who do we call? Mr. Wesley, the chairperson? Do we get all of them here? Do they have to public notice it? So I'm going to make a referral that I want at least two planning commissioners in the next meeting, the chairperson, Wesley, and whoever he chooses to answer questions about this recommendation that they brought in and sent. I just happened to see one here. So I'll make a formal referral that Mr. Wesley and any other commissioner except for Mr. Jewell be at our next legislative committee meeting. And I'm still waiting to hear from Ms. Williams. I think she's waited long enough. Mr. Stroud, in all due respect, if you want to answer me something, you don't have to do it publicly. I know you're going to refer to that with Rob Jewell. I'm gone from that. I want to move to Ms. Williams, if I may. I just wanted to clarify the question. You don't have to. Mr. Mays. Point of order. Point of order. Mr. Mays. Point of order. What is your point of order? You told me to wait to last. I ain't asked him no question. I'm ready to hear from Ms. Williams, and you just let him take the mic. I'm sorry, but I am the chair of this meeting, and I don't know where you're going. You're not leading this meeting, Mr. Mays. So if he had something to say, since it was a Q&A for Mr. Schrantz and Mr. Erickson, then by all means, let's move on to Ms. Williams. So you're going to take over my Q&A? It's not your Q&A. Man, look, y'all ready to get up out here and leave all of them sitting? Because when I leave, it ain't a quorum. You're not going to disrespect this First Ward Council's seat. Now, I'm telling you and Kevin Stroud, you're not going to disrespect me. You don't run this First Ward. I told him to wait, asked him to wait, and then said I wanted to hear from Ms. Williams. And you trying to prove something in a public arena that you're going to dictate to me. I done waited the last. I done said what I done had to say, and you don't run me. Now, what you want to do? You want me to hear from Ms. Williams, or you want this meeting to be over? Mr. Mays, you don't run this meeting. Watch this. God bless you. I'm gone. We gone. I apologize for what Mr. Mitchell you're not allowed please sit down and do not I can have Mr. Metcalf in closing I appreciated the public comments no one wanted to suppress anyone's voices we wanted to have everyone have a fair choice to speak thank you so much for your comments here I would like to indicate that the ordinance for medical marijuana facilities will be on the upcoming legislative committee agenda to be held on Wednesday March 7th at 5 p.m. and thank you all for attending this special legislative meeting this has been the February 28th 2018 special City of Flint City Council meeting <laughs> I don't need it.
presented by Spectacle Productions. And underwritten in part by the Flint Pipe Fitters Union, looking for pipe fitters apprentices throughout Flint. With more information available by calling 810-720-5243 or online at local370.com. Join us at WFOV for rebroadcast and simulcast of City Council and other government meetings. 92.1 LP FM Flint.